Hello and welcome to the Nebraska Library Commission's Public Library Accreditation Workshop for 2024. Um, I am Krista Porter. I am the Library Development Director here at the Nebraska Library Commission, and I am in charge of our accreditation process here. So I will be taking you through um, all of that um, in this uh, through our workshop we have going coming up. Uh, I also handle, in my department, we handle the certification program for boards, library boards and librarians, library staff, uh, E-rate grants, uh, children's services, uh, quite a few things are just kind of thrown in there in our uh, library development um, department. Uh, but today I am, as I said, we're talking about public library accreditation. We're about three hours ahead of us. We're going to take a break halfway through and um, hopefully we'll be able to cover everything you, you need to know about accreditation for the upcoming year. If you have any questions, please do post them, type them into the questions section whenever you think of them. I'll pause whenever you need to, whenever you have them and answer any questions you have throughout the workshop today. So I see that I did look up and see who is registered for today's session. I see we have a mixture of people, a mixture of libraries. Uh, some of you are due for, up for renewing your accreditation, your library's accreditation this year, which is great. Um, it's the perfect time to get started, get up to speed on what's happening and how the process works. Uh, some of you are due um, for renewal um, in future years, um, not this year, but in 2025, 2027, and later uh, but it's and that's great too it's great to get a head start on the process uh, there are some things that can take some time and and work to, to to work to get through everything and it's always good to get a head start on what's going on and um, we also have had people attending workshops who are both library staff directors or board members which is great too um, it's always good to have as many people as possible um, have everyone involved in the process and knowing what is um, going on, why this is being done, uh, how this benefits the library, everyone's on the same page uh, and, and is all invested in that. So we're gonna start here on the Nebraska Library Commission's homepage to show you how to access all the information about public library accreditation. So the Library Commission's website is just nlc.nebraska.gov. Uh, when we do send out information about accreditation, I will link you to their specific pages, but we're going to start here so I can show you how to get to it if you're just coming to the Library Commission's homepage. So over here on the left of the Library Commission's website, we have we go, um, flyout menu, and you see it opens up lots of various things that the Library Commission has various services we offer. And there's one here, um, the second one down is accreditation and certification. They are bundled together in the same flyout menu. Um, this is because a they are separate programs, but related programs. <laughs> uh, in order for uh, your library to be accredited, your library board has to be certified and your library director has to be certified. So these are three different programs we have and they all work together. Um, you can do certification just for your own knowledge and because you want to, but if you want to do have your library be accredited, those two things are two um, starting requirements, uh, two of the basic requirements. Uh, something I'll also mention right off, uh, right at the beginning here is that this accreditation program that we have here in Nebraska, this is not a national program. This is not something um, done by ALA, the American Library Association, or IMLS, the Institute of Museum and Library Services to the federal government. Uh, this is a, a statewide program uh, that we do here in Nebraska. It is so there's not any overreaching national group telling us what to do, what the rules are, how to handle it. We just run our own program for both certification and accreditation at the state level here at the library, through the Library Commission. Not all states do this. Some states do certifications and not accreditation. Some do a library accreditation and not certifications. Some do none of this and some do all like we do here in Nebraska. So if you uh, came here to Nebraska from another state or if you speak to colleagues in other states, you will hear different information about how 
board certification, librarian certification, and library accreditation works because in their states it's different. Uh, some things may be similar. Uh, we do keep an eye on what each other is doing and maybe borrow some, from some of their programs and they may borrow from us, but we are, there's no one telling every state what to do. It will be individual different for each state. There are uh, some updates, uh, small updates into the um, accreditation application form this year that we're going to show you and talk about that. Uh, there are some changes that were done a couple of years ago if you haven't done accreditation in a while that we'll also talk about so you are up to speed on all of that. So we have information here you can see on this pull-up menu. There's a main pages for the board certification, library board certification, librarian certification, so this is for any library staff, and and uh, the main the link to the main page for library accreditation. Uh, we're going to talk about the certifications a little bit later. Uh, we're going to start with the basics of accreditation and then pop back to the information here that we have about certifying uh, your board and your librarian when we, when we get to those uh, criteria. But I just want you to see here that these are all together. So everything you need that's related to your library getting accredited is all here on this one flyout menu. Very hopefully <laughs> easily accessible to you. So I'm going to open up the, uh, here for under library accreditation, we'll talk about that first. We have the main page. There is an application form, an online form that you fill in, and we're going to go through that. I'm going to show you all the, all the questions and everything that's in our online form. We're going to demo that. Uh, link the information about the various guidelines in the accreditation program. You can uh, link here to look up the status of any library, check your libraries, check any other library's accreditation status, see where, um, if they are accredited and at what level and when they when it expires. And then a link to the second thing that you need to submit when you are doing accreditation, which is the community needs response plan. So there's two things you have to submit to me to either uh, become a re-accredited if you're expiring or to become accredited, become accredited for the first time. That's the online application form in the community, your community needs response plan. Um, we're going to talk about, ideally, we're going to talk about the accreditation form in the first half of today's workshop and then the community needs response planning in the second half. We'll see how the timing, uh, how the timing ends up based on how I get through this and any questions that you all have. So I'm going to go to the main accreditation website here. Move some things around here on my other screen. There we go. All right, that's better. So this is our main accreditation webpage. As you can see here, right at the top, first thing it tells you is the process will begin July 1st, 2024. Um, and, and that is true. So right now uh, we are ahead of when the, the, the official process starts and opens when the accreditation application form goes live and that will be July 1st. So we're giving you this training before you have to jump in and before you're notified that you're due to renew or that you're being invited to become accredited for the first time. I did do a shorter session, shorter than this three hour full workshop uh, back on May 8th um, as part of our Encompass Live, our weekly webinar show that we do here. So if you want a uh, quicker version of this, a quickie version, you can go there and it has a link to the recording. It was a little over an hour long, 64 minutes. And so if there's someone that, that if you just want a, a quick overview, you can watch this recording. Uh, today we're going into the much more detail of all the different parts and how you um, fill out the form and how you do a, a community needs response plan. Um, this is just a general overview. So if maybe a board member doesn't need all the details of how to complete the form or uh, you want to explain to someone, some stakeholder, the mayor, city um, manager, whoever, this is why we're doing it. This is a shorter version of, of today's three hour workshop that they you know, could be a little easier for them to take. It's just, like I said, a little over an hour long. And of course, our second link here is saying that um, workshops are open to, um, for registration. Once the, all these uh, live workshops are done, we will have a recorded version of this, and that will be the link that we added there. So you will be able to go back afterwards to watch the full three-hour workshop if you wanted to, or again, refer anyone you want to to watching that. All of our recordings are out there free and public for anyone to watch. So the first thing that, often the first thing that people ask me when we talk about accreditation is why? Why should I do this? 
what is the uh, purpose of accreditation? Why should I go through all this work? It takes a lot of time and, and energy and thinking and people to do this. Um, what is the purpose of this whole program? Well, here in Nebraska, the purpose of library accreditation is to, as it says here, encourage excellent library service. Basically, we want to make sure that all the library services that all the citizens of the state are receiving is good. Um, that they are um, meeting certain benchmarks, that uh, you are you know, learning new things that you might be able to offer and providing them. Um, it's um, standards are minimum standards. You can, can, can consider these guidelines as minimum standards to meet, to uh, provide a, a good, excellent library service. You can um, brag about this to your community, you know, to anyone and saying, yes, we are accredited at uh, so-and-so um, level. Um, you can compare yourself to other libraries, too, and say, look, they're at this level. Maybe we should work to being at that same level, uh, work and getting to be in a higher level. Um, it is something to brag to stakeholders, to anyone who might be donating to the library or is unsure about donating to the library. Why? And what's special? Like, well, we are accredited at the silver level through the Nebraska Library Commission. We went through this big process <laughs> and uh, to show what we do here. Uh, so definitely bragging rights and just being able to show that the money and showing that the money that you are getting, the budget you receive is being used for good things. Uh, you know, proving that yes, what we're doing is useful and here is the proof, here's the fact that we went through this process. The Library Commission looked at what we were doing, the Library Commission being the state agency here for public libraries for all libraries in the state uh, and they have you know, said you know we are doing good things uh, you do have uh, you do also receive some uh, tangible things you get a certificate in the mail <laughs> that you can uh, hang up on your wall frame and hang up if you want to that says this library is accredited at so-and-so level for so many years uh, we also send you a graphic an online graphic of uh, a little badge that says the years that you're accredited for you could use that on your website on any newsletters that you um, print out, anything paper um, paper or online, you can use that to promote and announce that you've been accredited. Uh, we also, our regional library systems have window clings, little, a little symbol, a little seal that you can put on your library window that says this is an accredited library through the Nebraska Library Commission. So we help you <laughs> uh, brag about it by giving you those things as well. Uh, accreditation is valid for five years, so uh, that is something to that is something that did, was changed a couple of years ago. So that is something to be aware of. That this is um, for a five-year period, you're um, receiving this accreditation that you don't have to renew again for another um, five years. We originally, previously, it was a three-year period for accreditation. Uh, so you may remember that or hear about other people talking about that you got to do this every three years, uh, but we extended that to five years. We kind of fell into that by, uh, due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the, at the, when the pandemic was starting, which was in March of 2020, as we all know, uh, we were just gearing up to start the accreditation process for 2020, which goes live as this says here, July 1st. And as soon as the pandemic started, I immediately said, okay, this is, we do not need to have libraries to worry about, we need to be worrying about um, accreditation this year. Uh, there's plenty of other things going on. There's too much going on. Uh, they need to be focusing on this new this new emergency, this pandemic. So um, everyone is getting an extension for a year. So everyone got bumped an extra year to their accreditation, no matter where they, um, whether they expired in, in that year, 2020, or any other year. Uh, and then in 2021, things were still very bad. And so I gave another year extension. I said, nope, we're still going to hold off. So, and that, but we brought it back in 2022, brought, brought back accreditation. And by then, everyone had had five years. We had many people had mentioned in the past that three years was too short a period, anyways, that it wasn't enough time for things to have changed or updated or them to have made an, an effect in the library, in their community. So it had always been discussed that maybe it needs to be a longer time before you need to be reaccredited for the library needs to go through this process. So since we fell into that five years, anyways, um, Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we made that official. As of 2022, all accreditation is good for five years. 
Uh, we did have to move around some libraries and adjust some expirations to have about an equal number of libraries come up for reaccreditation every year. Uh, so some libraries did get a little extra and got bumped around, but um, now we're on this five-year uh, cycle for accreditation. So another major benefit of accreditation is, not to, to be blunt, money. <laughs> um, budgets are tight, as we all know. You're sometimes struggling to have the right enough funds to do anything in your library. And if your library is accredited, which the accreditation process itself is free, there is no cost to apply. Um, there's nothing that we charge you to, to do anything. It just takes your time, which I know time is money, but uh, we do not charge anything for this. There's no application fee or anything at all. Uh, but if you are accredited, you are eligible for to receive certain funds or to apply for certain grants. So this is also something to explain to anyone who is questioning, any of your stakeholders, anyone in charge, in your municipality of why are you going spending all this time doing this? Why are you going through all this process? Well, money is one major reason. First thing is you are eligible to receive state aid. This is uh, money that we receive from the Nebraska legislature, from the state budget, uh, specifically just to give out to public libraries to help, um, just to, to supplement your current budget that you have. There are no um, restrictions or rules on how you can use it. It's not a grant where you have to report back to us on what you've done with it, or you have to meet certain criteria to receive it. The only criteria is that you are a um, library that is an accredited public library in Nebraska. There are also incentive payments. If you are at one of our higher levels, there's three levels of accreditation. If you're silver or gold, you get a little extra, an extra $200 for silver and an extra 400 for gold. This is on top of your basic state aid funding. And I'll show you here the State Aid for Public Libraries website. Um, as you can see, it says you have to be accredited and you have to actually also have to have completed the public library survey uh, uh, that we um, do. This is also a requirement for accreditation, so it's kind of, can't be accredited unless you've done that survey anyways. <laughs> um, and you can look here and see the formula. The State Aid formula is based on your population served. So depending on how um, large your community is, you get a certain amount, a certain, a certain base amount, and then a certain amount addition for, per capita. Um, and then if you are at silver or gold accreditation level, you get that extra as well. So you can look up your library on here and see for 2024 uh, how much your library received and then how much is per capita total. So this is something good also to show, show your stakeholders we're getting this money because we did uh, accreditation. The second thing here at the Library Commission that's money related is gr our grant programs. Uh, in order to be eligible to apply for any of our grants that we offer here, you do need to be an accredited public library. This is our CE and training grants, internship grants, library improvement grants, and youth grants for excellence. So to apply for any of those. Right now, uh, these grants have already been distributed for 2024. Uh, the grants go live always in the fall before the year that the funding will be distributed and used when you're doing whatever the grant program is. So right now there's not anything to apply for, but if we look at the grant webpage, you can see that last year uh, they went live most, it says you're in September, and then everyone should have been notified by December, and then you receive the funding in the next year. So this fall, you can look ahead, uh, look forward to these grants opening up again. And then you, if your library is accredited, you can apply for the funding that we will be dispersing in 2025. The CE one is a little different. We have two rounds of grants for the CE grants. Uh, so there was one that opened up in September that was for um, events and programs that you had attended for the first half of the year. And then we open a second round in the spring for events and things for the second half of a year. So uh, that's why that one has a different date right now. But it will also open in September. These are the 2020, the previous year's dates. The specific dates will be announced later in the year. But in order to apply for any of those grants, you do need to be accredited. Uh, and beyond the library, outside of the Library Commission, two groups, organizations have decided to also use our public library accreditation as one of their criteria. Uh, Nebraska's Department of Economic Development and the USDA. Uh, these 
both of these groups have grants. There's community development block grants that come from the Department of Economic Development, and the USDA has grants and loans. And I note here that these are both for community facilities. That means buildings. So doing an upgrade to your, to your building, renovations, building a new library, anything that's kind of construction, you can use both of these grants for. And I note that because at the Library Commission, we do not currently have any grants that can that are eligible for doing major construction projects or any construction projects like that. Our library improvement grants are, uh, the funding for those comes from IMLS, Institute of Museum and Library Services. This is Library Service and Technology Act funds. And they are restricted to not being for capital improvements. So not being for anything that would be a permanent um, addition or change to your library building. So library improvement grants would be for programs, uh, resources, databases, or anything physical in the library that isn't permanently attached, so like freestanding shelves, freestanding desks that can move around, those kind of things. So since we are restricted on not being able to give out that kind of funding, we do try and promote to you that there are other grants so that you can use for that. And both of these are for those purposes. So if you're looking to do any renovations to your library, any upgrades or updates, or if you're lucky to be thinking about building a new library, <laughs> uh, both of these grants are, are options for that. But you do need to be accredited to apply for those as well. So those are the benefits, the reason for uh, the, the purpose for accreditation and some of the benefits for it. Bragging rights, um, comparing yourself to other libraries, meeting certain standards and benchmarks, and then being eligible for all of this additional funding for your library. All right, so there are, as I've already mentioned, three levels of accreditation. bronze, silver, and gold. And the way you earn a, a particular level is through earning points. Uh, assist, uh, in the accreditation application form, when we go and look at that, there are very, uh, all these different guidelines that you can meet. And if you meet a certain guideline, you get to check off a box and say, yep, we do that. Yes, we do that. Yes, we do that. <laughs> and then uh, you earn those points. There is a total of 285 points available right now in 2024, and you need to do a minimum, earn a minimum of 175 for bronze, 200 for silver, 250 for gold. Um, there's nothing special if you go over 250. <laughs> um, it's, it, you just have a varying, you know, more points than what you need to meet the gold level. Um, this is a, this program, this a points, version of iteration of accreditation was uh, put into place in 2013 um, to to make it more equitable more more um, fair about to every library reflecting more accurately what's happening in each unique um, community uh, the previous version of accreditation was a all or nothing where in order to meet the lowest level you had to meet all of these criteria criteria that were listed every single one and if you met all of them, boom, you got the lowest level. Then you could try for the second level and you had a whole nother group of criteria you had to meet every single one of them to be accredited at that second level. And then the same thing for the third. Uh, this was very you know, strict and everyone was being considered to do the half, I was told to have to do the same exact thing. But that's not how it works in reality. Every community is different. Every community is unique. Every library is unique and has diff and their community has different needs and needs different services than um, a community just down the road. So they decided in 2013, they did a major review and overhaul of the program and went to the points system instead. There are some basic criteria you have to meet. There's just 12 minimum qualifications. But beyond that, there's a ton of things that you can um, earn points on. And if your your library can earn points in one area that another library doesn't, and they may earn points in an area that you don't, that's because certain things are needed in different communities. Uh, it just makes it much easier and you know reflected much better what libraries are really doing. In the old version, if you miss just one guideline, for example, for the lowest level, you, there, I'm just I don't remember if this if this is exact how many there were, but if there are 20 criteria and you only net 19, you didn't get to be accredited at all. The second level, same thing. If you met 19 of the 20 needed for the second level, but you missed just one, 
you don't get to be a credit of the second level. And that was really restrictive and not very you know, well received by libraries. Like just one little thing I didn't do. Ugh. So we switched to this point system, which I think is much more logical, much easier. And you just go and check off all the things you do. And you may um, become silver level by doing different things than another library does. And that just reflects what um, how everyone is different. Every library is different. We, as I said, you can look up your uh, library's uh, status here or any library. Open up that new tab here. So you can see here, uh, by default, this is by alphabetical by city, but you can resort it by library name, regional library system, expiration year, and accreditation level. So you can see what the library is, what their level is, and when they expire. Uh, accreditation is good to the end of the year, so it's good through December 31st of whatever year that it expires. So when you are doing your renewal, uh, for example, you know, Ainsworth is working, would be working on theirs this year, they're working on it now while they are still accredited. So you don't like lose accreditation, have to get it back while you're working on the process. You're accredited all the way to the end of the year while you go through the process of renewing, and then your new renewal will start and your new accreditation period start with 2025 and be good through uh, 2029. Yeah. Uh, the links here are, if we know a library has a website, uh, we, you click on that, we'll open up that library's uh, web page. Uh, blank ones here, they've just not been ever been accredited. Uh, this is a voluntary program. You do not have to be accredited. It's um, up to your community, your library, if you want to go through the process and do it. So some libraries just have never done it. And there are some that have expired recently. Uh, 2014 that's a while ago um who just were unable to keep up with it or for whatever reason missed some um keeping up with the process and um, or some have chosen to not continue the accreditation that happens too um so those recent ones you'll see in red sometimes all right so the accreditation uh the process schedule as it says at the top of the page here, starts July 1st of every year. So on July 1st, which is Monday, July 1st, everyone who is up for reaccreditation in 2024 and any libraries who have not been accredited before and have submitted the public library survey and our library commission supplemental survey will receive an email from me inviting you to start your accreditation process. Accreditation process. Uh, July 1st is when the online application form goes live for you to access your personalized uh, form. Um, the application form online and the community needs response plan that you will write up, that you will compose, are due by October 1st to me. And then at the very latest, by December 31st, you'll be notified um, if you've been accredited or reaccredited and what your accreditation level may be if you've gone up or down, depending. <clears throat> now, these are our dates. They are not in stone, as I guess is the way I'll say it. If you need an extension, we can give you extensions. I do this every year for libraries. I understand things happen. Um, if it's getting up to October 1st and you haven't um, submitted your form yet or you're still working on your plan and you would like a month or a month or two extension, I've done that before. I can give you an extension in November 1st, December 1st, whatever you think you might need. If you just need a little bit more time, um, we, I can work with you on that. If there is something major happening in your library, uh, for example, you're a brand new library director and just started yesterday, and this is your first year, I'm not gonna make you go through accreditation unless you really want to. <laughs> uh, I do sometimes proactively reach out to libraries and say, hey, I see you just became the director and you're, you happen to be due for accreditation, reaccreditation this year. I'm giving you an extension, one less thing for you to learn um, about this library your first year there. Uh, but if you just need this kind of extension yourself, just reach out to me, keep in communication. Uh, also, if there's been any other, other reasons why you're, you're struggling at your library, was there flooding back in 2019 we had major flooding here in nebraska and a lot of libraries we gave extensions they had enough to deal with figuring out you know their flooded libraries got extensions and a year extension um, if a tornado comes through your life your community which happens here in nebraska we live in 
in that area, uh, let me know and we can give you an extension. So, or any other uh, reasons, if your your board has suddenly lost a bunch of members and they're struggling to help you keep up with this, just, just let me know and we can give you either a few months extension or a whole year, depending on your extenuating circumstances. Like I said at the beginning, this is a program that we run here through the Library Commission. I'm in charge of it, and I can give you any sort of that um, leeway if you need. The accreditation application form goes live July 1st. The community's response plan, you can be working on at any time you want to. You do not have to wait. Um, this is a separate document that you compose yourself or you update from a previous version you had. And you can be working on that ahead of time at any time you, you want to. It's also maybe a good time, good idea to work out on it even earlier. So you have plenty of time to do all the work you might need to, to write up or update your plan. Like I said, we'll get into all those details in the second half of today's workshop, but you can work on those that at any time. Um, but both of these do October 1st. Uh, as soon as I receive both of these items, then I start reviewing um, and evaluating your application and your form to get and your plan together. I do need both of them before I can do that because there are things that you will mention in your plan that are boxes you can check off on your application form. Uh, and there's things in your application form that if you check them off, I want to make sure you've mentioned them in your plan. So they do work together. So you can submit your application as soon as you want to, and I will just hold on. To, if I don't have a plan from you yet, I will hold on to it and wait for you to send me your plan or vice versa. Send me your plan first and then work on your application. Once I have them both, I look at them together because I will, like I said, I compare them. And if I see you talked about something in your plan, but you forgot to check that box on your online form, I will let you know so you can earn those points. <laughs> and the other way around, you mentioned something, you checked off something on your plan, on your application form, but did not mention it in your plan, I'll ask you about it. I'll say, hey, you, you checked this box, but I don't see that written up on here. Uh, can you elaborate, explain, let me know what you're actually doing. Um, so there will be back and forth once you submitted these. It's not just you submit them and there's, you hear nothing from me. Um, if everything's fine, you'll hear from me and saying, yeah, you've been accredited, uh, but there may be back and forth and that's fine. Uh, you can send me a draft version of your plan if you want to, or parts of it as you're working on it. And I can give you a feedback and advice as you're, as you're doing it. Uh, your regional library system directors are good resources for that as well. They can help you uh, work on those plans or review something if you want their input on, on those as well. All right. All right. Any questions yet about the basics, uh, what we've talked about so far? Type in your questions section whenever you think of anything. Let me get a drink here. <clears throat> So there are some requirements before you can apply for accreditation. Uh, the first thing which I kind of mentioned earlier and mentioned in relation to state aid is you do need to have submitted the Public Library Survey and our Nebraska Library Commission Supplemental Survey. These are done by Sam Shaw here at the Library Commission, so I'm sure you've all heard of and worked with him. The surveys usually open up in November and then uh, close um, in February. And the dates vary each from year to year, of course. So by February, you would have submitted both of those and then we use that data to determine giving state aid and to determine um, if you can are eligible for um, accreditation. So something also to note here is this says to apply and to maintain your library's accreditation. This is not just a one-time thing where you do this once and then you get to sit back and do nothing for five years and then you do your survey and your things again five years later. You do have to keep this up throughout the time, your, your certification, your accreditation period. So you do have to keep submitting the library survey every year. It is an annual survey. Um, this is a national survey where we um, that we uh, report. Um, the supplemental survey that we do is actually a very short one, just as a few extra questions, some extra things that we wanted to know about libraries that just was not on the public library survey. So you have to submit those uh, to be invited or to renew and to keep up your accreditation, keep doing those every year. You have to have that community's response plan and we will talk about that 
And as I said, in the second half of the workshop, there's a whole separate page all about community needs response planning with all sorts of guides and help. Um, and then there are 12 minimum qualifications that you have to uh, meet. And we're gonna go into the details of those in a bit here. So there, there's 12 basic things that everybody has to do, but only 12. Um, the application form itself has, I, I should count some time, <laughs> tons of different ex additional questions uh, that and different criteria you can meet to earn those um, additional points. So the application form itself that we are gonna look at in just a minute here, well, a few minutes here, it is broken up into five different categories. Uh, governance and planning, resources, services, cooperation and collaboration, and communications. The accreditation application form right now is not live. Uh, as I mentioned, it goes live on July 1st, but there is a preview application that you can look at if you want to. This is just a static page that shows you what the questions are that will that are going to be on your live form. So if you wanted to look ahead to see, you know, what are am I going to be asked? Where can I earn points? This is something that you can look at. You'll note here, if you try, so you can see here, this is a form with boxes. You can tap, tap, tap all you want. These, they don't do anything. <laughs> this is just a, a dummy form, so to speak, a, a static page with um, all the questions. It's just a duplicate of what will be the live form uh, on July, July 1st. The help guides here, those are live though. You can click on these little yellow circles with a question mark and there's a lot of explanation for some of the uh, guidelines on here so you can learn more about them. So that is all live here on the preview app, uh, application form. So if you wanna get a head start or an idea what questions are, you can look at that. When I do get into the application form here today, I've got a, um, behind the scenes way of being able to get a live application going <laughs> so that I can demo one live for you. But that's just because I'm here in house at the library commission and I can do that. Um, some of the guidelines on the accreditation application form are automatically pre-filled with data you've already submitted through the public library survey. So we use some, some of the questions that you've already answered there as guidelines in the accreditation process. Uh, we don't want you to have to re-report those, re, you know, answer those questions all over again. You already answered them once. So we have that data. We just automatically fill those questions in on your application form. Uh, we also use the same password that you used, uh, same username and password that you use for the public library survey for you to log into your library's personalized Accreditation application form. Again, don't want, didn't want you to have to you know, learn a new password as there's too many we all have to keep track of. So the same one you've already been using for your public library survey, you'll use to log into your library's accreditation application form. There are some of the guidelines use data from the public library survey and we do peer comparisons for them. Uh, this is where we compare your library to another other libraries that are similar in size, serve a similar size community. Uh, these nine guidelines are done as peer comparisons. So we compare uh, income, hours, et cetera, et cetera, to other libraries in similar size to you. When you are in your library's accreditation application form, there'll be a button where you can see who your peer libraries are so you know who we're comparing you to. As I said, this is based on community size and it's libraries above, bigger and smaller than yours uh, within 15% size difference. So your library sits in the middle, so there's a few, that, some libraries that are smaller, some that are larger, and we um, compare these, these uh, the data for these. Now, this is something that has been questioned, libraries have questioned over the years as well. Um, is just size of community really an accurate way to compare? Should we use other criteria? because they know, you know, my community, my community is this size, but this other community who serves the same population, they have a much bigger budget. So they can do a lot more than, than we can. Is that really a fair comparison? So we, we took that, those, um, that, those comments, and we actually did attempt some testing last year, uh, last year or the year before, and added in some other criteria, like um, budget, uh, staff size, other things that might affect how your library can provide services compared to another one. And then we did the comparisons again, and it turned out they think they spit it spit out the same libraries anyways. 
Um, having all of those criteria didn't really make a difference in who you would end up being compared to. So we tried. Uh, we we did try to make it, you know, have more more things that we would use, but in our testing, it didn't make a difference. So we just went back and said, okay, it's much easier just to use one criteria to bring to, to create this list. So we are still just going to stick with legal service area. Um, you can meet either for all of these peer comparisons, you can either meet or exceed the average of all the libraries or uh, which is the mean or the median where the value lying in the middle when all the statistics, all the numbers are arrayed in, in size order from lowest to highest. Either one of those you can meet. Um, for these things previously, and you may remember this, you may hear some people talk about the fact that previously you had to be open a certain number of hours. You had to have a certain number of staff possibly, a uh, certain co collection size in order to meet a certain criteria, a certain guideline and accreditation. That was not something that was really equitable to be more realistic. That, was, that wasn't something really realistic. You know, Not every library can be open a certain number of hours or needs to be. Uh, we decided these were things that did not need minimums for you to meet them, so we decided to do a comparison. Um, rather than just setting an arbitrary number saying every library needs to open these number of hours, uh, you have to be open on weekends or evenings, that was, I believe, previous criteria. Uh, we do not have that anymore. Do not have to do any of these things for a, a, a certain level. You just have to be similar to libraries who serve similar size communities as yours. So we think this is a much uh, more equitable way of deciding if you meet these criteria. If you do have questions about any of this peer library data, Sam Shaw, he's the one who gathers, you know, runs our public library survey. So he has all the data. Um, as I said, in your application form, you can see who your peer libraries are. But if you would like to know what they reported on their surveys, Sam can pull that data together for you. All the public library survey data is actually public anyways. Um, we posted on our website, there's a giant spreadsheet of here in Nebraska of every library <laughs> and um, what, they're, what they're submitted. But if you just want to see what, are, what did my peer libraries do, submit, Sam can pull out just those numbers and send you a spreadsheet, spreadsheet of just your peer libraries. So ask him if you do want to see some of that data. Some of our peer libraries may be outside of Nebraska. Uh, for some communities, maybe the larger ones, they're not, there are not enough communities of the same size in the state. So we do sometimes have to reach out to other states, Iowa, Kansas, so similar types of states as Nebraska, um, and we look for some libraries there. So depending on the size of your community, you may see some libraries that are outside of Nebraska on your peer library list. All right, any questions before we pop into these qualifications and get into an actual application form? All right, so you got your public library survey, you're working on a community's response plan. Let's pop, let's, now we can go into the actual application form. And when you click there, um, for the 12 minimum qualifications or when I invite you to apply and you actually go to apply to submit your form, this is the first page you get. Big red box at the top, top says process starts July 1st. So if you try to go in right now to this, it's not going to let you log into anything because it's not live. But I do have over here a, um, like I said, a demo form that I've already logged into. Uh, so these are the 12 minimum qualifications that your library must meet. There is, as I said, there's the yellow, if you click here on the um, question mark and the yellow circle, this pops, opens up uh, guidelines that are related to these 12 qualifications, uh, help that are related to these 12 qualifications. So basic information about the, that Nebraska statutes and other things that, um, that help you understand all of these qualifications. So the first one is that your library is legally established under state statute. State statutes in Nebraska are most, uh, most library laws are in chapter 51. Uh, depending on the size of your library and some other things, you might be looking at other statutes as well. Uh, 
but legally established and we have links like i said here to the nebraska legislature website where you can look at the specific chapter 51 or chapter 16 um, statutes that explain this in in legal detail but to be legally established in nebraska there are two things that need to happen for your library to be considered legally established one you your municipality your city village council city board whatever uh, has to have a resolution an ordinance something where they said we want to have a public library uh, that could have been done 20 years ago 50 years ago whenever the library was first created and then secondly you have to have a library board that has at least five members on it which of those two things you are considered legally established in the state of nebraska now you are not required to be legally established to be a library a public library in nebraska uh, you just need to be legally established in order to apply for accreditation or to use some of the resources and be able eligible for some of the services and, and resources we offer through the library commission we are happy to have anybody have a public library you can you know set up something in your city offices with books that you loan out back and forth and you've got someone who's happy to run it and or you want to do a summer reading program or something that's fine uh you can have a volunteer run library where people just do it at uh, as as uh, a good faith on the honor system um you can have a, anything you want and call it a public library in nebraska that is you're allowed to do that it's not illegal to have to do that at all uh, so we have all sorts of uh, communities that do have a public library but they just aren't legally established they don't have a board that helps them run it because it's just too small doesn't need that kind of you know guidance um, and that's perfectly fine so we have all types of libraries in the state but for accreditation you have to make sure you're legally established have an ordinance or a resolution stating that you're creating this library and have that board set up with a minimum of uh, five members You also need to be in compliance with any other Nebraska library laws, rules, regulations, any local laws that your community sets for the library, and any national or federal laws that might have to do with um, libraries. So privacy laws, things like that. And again, you'll find some help about that uh, in our help over here, Nebraska laws, federal laws, open meetings act laws this is something that your board your library board has to be in compliance with the open meetings act laws uh, well your library board is a public body so they are required to be open have open meetings um, lots of other rules about that we did do a an encompass live show about that just last year uh, we've done one about annually because sometimes the the legislature does have certain bills do change the criteria for the Open Meetings Act in Nebraska. So I recommend going and looking at our library, um, Encompass live recordings and look for the Open Meetings Law session. Uh, Scott Childers, who is our executive director of our Southeast Library um, System, uh, he's an expert in that area and he's done a presentation for us about Nebraska open, open, open Meetings Laws. So check up in that on that if you need to. As I said, you do have to have a, um, a library board. Uh, you can be a governing board or an advisory board, and you do have to follow the, you have to have bylaws that um, detail how your board is run and follow the open meetings law. Uh, as far as the state statute does say, having the five board members, we do understand that sometimes that those numbers will vary. If someone has quit recently or left or their term has expired, and you haven't gotten anyone new, it's okay to have a break, you know, where you don't have a full five sometimes. We understand that will happen. Um, but just try to, as much as you can, to have that full board of a minimum of, of five members. And now we get into the certification that we were talking about earlier. Both your library board and your library director must be certified through our Nebraska Library Commission certification program. So let's pop back over to our main page here. And I am going to open up that flyout menu again. And we're gonna talk about certification for a bit here. <clears throat> All right, 
So board certification and librarian, library staff certification are similar programs, uh, but they do have their own rule, slightly different rules sometimes, but they work about similarly. Uh, there is an application form for both. So you do need to let us know that you are doing continuing education and attending workshops and sessions and things for the purpose of uh, being accredited. There is a library board manual, which is a great resource for if you've got new board members or even existing ones that just need a, need a refresher on how does a board do their job, what's their work, you can they have a library board manual. For directors, we have a director's guidebook. Um, a great, what does it mean to be a library director in Nebraska? Highly recommend using both of those regularly when you are uh, either being doing your director work or if you are a board member or working with your board. You can look up the status of your library board or your own personal um, continuing education records. So you can see if you are certified or not, how many um, and what you need to still do to maintain or keep up your certification. They each have their own individual forms to submit continuing education credits to. So for boards, they've got a special form. Uh, for uh, library staff, they have a special form. So different form for each of them. So let's go into the board certification page first. So the purpose of these certification programs is really to make sure that your for the board program, make sure your board knows what they are supposed to be doing as a library board. Um, make them make them make sure that they are being effective, that they are following all the rules, uh, that they are learning more about what's going, what's going, how libraries work, how they're supposed to be working with libraries. Uh, just like anything, lifelong learning is important. So keeping up on that is what we're encouraging in these certification programs. So for a board, the board as a whole must do 20 hours of CE, continuing education, during a three-year certification period. So certification is three years, or accreditation for the library is a five-year period. But certification is, needs to be renewed every three years. So this is the board, and so to explain clearly, this is the board as a whole doing 20 hours of CE, not each individual person doing 20 hours. So if you do have that full five people on your board, each member only has to do four hours of continuing education in a three-year period. Easy, right? Should not be difficult to um, complete that. Um, although some boards do still struggle with it and we do, we can help you out if you are, your board is struggling, but that is um, how it works. 20 hours in a three-year period, if you divvy it up, four hours per person. Okay. As I said, there is a, before you do this, you do want to apply. Your board has to let us know that you are wanting to be certified for, um, uh, for the purpose of uh, accreditation. Like I said, it's not required that your board be certified. It's only required that they be certified if the library wants to be accredited. So um, this is where you would um, enter that basic information about your library board. And once we know that, then whenever anyone who is on your board submits CE, we know that that's what they're going for. There is a special form for boards to submit their CE activity. If all the board members do something together, like you all sit through a, a one hour workshop, like that one hour accreditation session that I did, you just have to enter the activity once and then list all the people that attended. If all five board members sat through that one hour workshop, you've earned five hours of CE for all of them sitting together for one hour. Um, I'm confirming I want to leave because I have not submitted the paid the form, so I'm saying yes. And then you can look up your board certification status. This is all public information. So you can see here um, all the libraries, again, very similar to the uh, accreditation page where uh, it's automatically sorted by city, but you can resort it by library name if you're looking for your library system or expiration date. So you can see if the board is certified, when they are due to expire, um, and in which system they are in. Uh, on here, if something's in red, as you can see, their certification has expired. 
Um, now that may be because they're no longer doing accreditation. They may be for other reasons, who knows. And here you'll see every single library has a link because here this link goes to that library's um, board continuing education record. So uh, you as a library director can see what your board is doing or a board president or any board members can see where we are in the process. Uh, so here you can see for Ainsworth, uh, they have, these are all the different things that their board has attended or let us know that they participated in, um, how many hours it was worth, and then just um, initials of who attended. They currently have done 12, 17 of their 20 hours. They need three more to do by the end of September. Not a problem. I'm sure they'll get that done without any issue. We also list here who we know are your board members. This is something that you submit to us using that supplemental survey, the Library Commission supplemental survey, um, or you can just let us know with a link here if anything has changed. So if you're looking and you see, oh wait, so-and-so is no longer on the board anymore, let us know so we know who is a board member so that we know when things are submitted to us, um, that's who should be earning the CE. For some, for anything that is done by the library commission things that we do like our big talk from small libraries conference or our uh, any, attending encompass live shows we record the ce for you so i am keeping track we're going to actually we'll get a spreadsheet out of GoToWebinar showing me who attended today and that i will use to submit uh, for ce so anything the commission does we will submit your ce on your behalf you don't have to sit, submit that special form either board or librarian but if it's something that you did that was not hosted by us, like this is a Central, Play, Central, Central Plains Library System event, then you would go and submit the form to let us know. All right, so, oh wait, that's where I wanna go, okay. So what can you what your what can your board do to earn these CE credits? Well, all sorts of things, all sorts of things. Uh, webinars, workshops, conferences, online or in person. Um, you do need to do a minimum amount of time. You have to do a minimum of 20 minutes to earn a half a credit. And if you break the 45 minute mark, you get the full out, full credit. And that is for anything. You can be do these things in person, live and in person on record. Um, live online, recorded online, in person, um, any any way of doing it. We also here at the Library Commission do pay a membership to, a statewide membership to United for Libraries. United for Libraries is the American Library Association's division for um, foundations, friends, boards, trustees, and they provide, um, create a lot of training and educational resources for libraries. Or for library boards. So we pay for the anyone in the state of Nebraska to, to attend them. There are trustee academy courses, which are longer sessions, each one worth a uh, full credit. And the short takes for trustees, they're eight, 10 minute long videos. So each video is worth a quarter of a credit. So you'd watch multiple ones of those to add them up. Previously, there was a statewide login for United for Libraries, but they changed that a couple of years ago, and now each individual person has their own login. So you would go here, each of your board members would go here to log in and create their own account, and then um, be able to watch all of the, attend all of the workshops, the courses, watch the videos, whatever. Um, you can also create like a general login for the library if you want to, whatever works for you, however you're gonna have them access them. Oh, we do have a question about here about boards. Uh, let's see here, do all board members have to be certified? Oh, okay, so it might, be, it might have been a little confusing. No, it's not, this is not certification for each individual person, this is the board as a whole. So on our side, the library board is certified and it depends on who's done all the CE. Um, each, C, each board member doesn't have to do a certain amount. You know, I did explain that 20 hours divided by five is four per person, uh, but it doesn't have to come out that way. It just depends on who attends things. Uh, you could have one person who does 10 hours of CE and then the rest divide up the other 10 
just because of how it falls out. Um, you could have one person that does all the CE. That would not be the, the best way because you want everyone to learn these things. Uh, but so it's not individual board members being certified. It's the board itself as an entity being certified. Hope that clears things up. Yes, awesome. Thank you. All right. <laughs> So for the Trustee Academy, uh, there are uh, multiple courses here. Uh, and as you can see here, the basics of being a board, working effectively with the library director, budgets, advocacy, equity, diversity, diversity, inclusion, et cetera. So you log, create an account, log in, and do these courses. The short takes are shorter videos. Uh, as it says here, about eight to 10 minutes each. So these are much quicker things. These are the kind of things maybe at the end of a board meeting, you should, could watch one of these one or two, and then the next board of reading, watch another one. And as they add up, you'll gradually get a quarter of a CE for each one that you do. Um, other states we've discovered um, have also put together some great resource, great training videos, Pennsylvania and Wyoming. Uh, these, some of these are kind of old, but they are still good basic info, so that's why we still have them here. So you can watch any one of these. As you can see, it states these are also worth a quarter of a CE each. And then there have been some Encompass Life shows that we've done that uh, would be um, applicable to boards, learning about Web Junction for training, advocating, United for Libraries, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, United for Libraries itself does lots of training. They do a monthly webinar series. And as we have our um, statewide um, membership that we apply for, you, anyone can go and watch any of those. They do a virtual conference every year. This is going to be updated. They have a conference coming up this year at the end of July. And we pay for statewide um, registration for this conference. So this United for Libraries virtual 2024 um, will be free to anyone in Nebraska to attend. Look for an update on that coming soon. We're still working out the payment of that and the registration. Um, and then there's lots of other webinars you can attend as well. Um, we have a list of free webinars you can link to, you know, check, take a look at those and see if anything is related to being a library board member. That's really uh, the key. Um, if you have any questions about certification or what is about, um, eligible for CE, Holly Duggan, she is our continuing education coordinator here at the Library Commission. She's in charge of the program. She will, um, you can ask her. So if you're unsure about something, unless it's something that's obviously listed here, blatantly listed here, um, something you've just found that you want to attend and you want to know, is this would this actually count for my board certification? Email her and ask and she'll let you know if it's eligible or not. So that is our board certification. Any other questions about board certification? All right, let's go on to librarian certification. So we also have a public librarian certification program. This is for anyone who is a current library staff member in Nebraska or anyone who's considering being staff. So basically, anybody in Nebraska can um, participate in these programs. Same thing as accreditation, all of this is free. There's no fee to pay to um, become certified, either your board or your staff. Uh, for librarian certification, this is to also keep improving in library service throughout the state. Make sure that even after you've had maybe your basic library training or library education, if you have had that, you're keeping up with what's going on in the field, keeping up with uh, library world, and um, just always updating your skills and knowledge for new things that have um, come up. There is, again, an application to submit to let us know that you are wanting to participate in the program so that when you do attend things that we do here through the Library Commission, we know that it will be, it'll count towards your uh, librarian certification. When you apply for certification, it, you also have to tell us what level of education you have, because that depends on what level of certification you are eligible for. Oops. And you'll see here the different levels that are available that we, that we have, uh, one through five. And if you have a library degree of some sort, you are at that particular level. If you don't have a library degree, you're at a different, you have a different level. Um, 
and we you can have a any kind of education will get you up to whatever level it is uh, library degrees will get you theirs um, so you could have a associate's degree bachelor's degree any sort of um, master's degree and that will get you to higher levels we however we do know that here, and the reason we have these different levels between having a library degree and not is we do know that not everybody in at li working at libraries here in nebraska is going to have a degree or wants to have a degree wants to go to library school and get that master's or bachelor's or whatever uh, you're just the person running the library along with doing other things in the town and that's just not on your radar of getting any sort of degree and that is fine what we have for that is our basic skills program this is basic courses it's a free program does not cost anything to take these courses that teach you the basics of being a librarian in Nebraska. So if you do not have a library degree and you wanna go for a level of certification, you would take these basic skills classes your first year through. Um, there are, in order to have it meet the criteria for certification, you have to do six basic basic skills classes, six required basic skills classes, and then you get to pick another seven out of these electives. And you can see these are some of the, bas the, the basics of being a library director of programming, library technology, library governance. Um, up here under acquired courses, intellectual freedom, customer service, collection management, et cetera, et cetera. We have a schedule of these classes. They run every single year in this order. Uh, so you can always depend on in February, there'll be a customer service class. In March, there'll be library governance. Uh, basic the credit certification for library staff is also a three-year certification. So you're, if you have do not have a library degree within your three years, your first three years, you have to take all the courses required, the six basics, the six required courses, um, which are noted with an asterisk on here, and then an additional seven. So you can look at this schedule now and plan out your three years of I'll take these ones this year and then these the next year and these the next and you can guarantee that they'll generally fall at this same same time frame every year the specific dates will vary of course we try and start them on a Monday but they will vary a couple of these are self-paced now our communication class you can take it any time um, and our introduction to cataloging it is self-paced but during the full month of April all the other classes you'll see your two two week classes So if you um, need to, this is where you can plan and take your basic skills courses in order to be certified. And we'll see when we get the application form how this relates to your library director being certified. Remember the library director, the reason we're talking about this is because your library director is required to be certified. Additional staff can also be certified and you can earn um, additional points towards your accreditation if some of your other staff are also um, certified. So I said, this is a three-year period and it is, but it is, you do have to do more CE hours than a board does. A li for library staff, you have to do 45 hours of CE credit um, in a three-year period. Uh, breaking this up, that's only 15 a year. Attending workshops and Encompass Live shows and conferences and meetings shouldn't be too hard to do 15 a year. If you are also taking any of the basic skills courses, those are each worth two credits each, those count towards your 25 as well. So um, you should have plenty of um, opportunities and ways to earn your uh, 45 hours of CE required for a librarian. Now there's more information in here about uh, details about the program, uh, but I'm gonna bump down to this uh, page for earning your credit. So what can you do to earn your CE for, as a librarian, library or library staff? I guess I mean. Same kind of thing as boards, you can see webinars, workshops, conferences, lectures, whatever you attend, live, in person, online. Same breakdown, minimum 20 minutes to get that half credit. You break that 45 minute mark, you're working on a full, um, academic courses for college credit you can take, um, online courses, 
Uh, something extra that is, I, I really love this, this um, option here, is if you are presenting, if you are teaching something, you can earn CE for that. So not just attending and learning, but being the, the instructor. So if you per, perhaps come on Encompass Live and are a guest presenter for me, you can earn an hour of CE for presenting um, on the show. Uh, if you just recently, I know the call for speakers closed for our Nebraska Library Association annual conference. If you submitted a proposal there and you've accepted and present there, you can earn CE for presenting there um, or at any other um, conference. Uh, doing professional reading, publishing something in a journal. So all of these things, um, other additional things that you can earn CE for. So it's not just sitting somewhere for an hour watching a webinar. There's a lot of other things that you can do to earn CE um, for library, um, the library, public librarian certification. If you're wondering what counts or doesn't, same thing, reach out to Holly or Mary Geibel. She's our administrative assistant here in library development. Either one of them can um, confirm for you if something you're attending or presenting at or a course you're taking uh, does count. All right, so that's our two certification programs. Oops, I'm gonna pop back to this. Anybody have any questions about board certification, any other questions about board certification or librarian certification? <clears throat> oh, we have a question here about librarian certification. Uh, do librarian certification hours roll over if you have extra before your due date? Ah, okay, so no, the answer would be no. You So if you do more than 45 hours, um, and it's the end of your three-year period, it's it, the 45 hours have to be done within that three-year certification period. So they count only for that three years. Same thing for boards. So if you, for whatever reason, you attended more things and you end up with like 50 hours, no, we don't get to bump over to the next year because the next three years is a different certification period. You have to earn the CE during that three-year time, each three-year time. So they do not roll over. You can't do a whole bunch now and then not do anything uh, the next one. It's during that three-year certification period. You have to take the CE, <clears throat> attend the sessions during that three-year period. All right, I don't see any other certification questions coming in. All right, let's go on with the application form. Um, so board certified, library director certified. Uh, you also, minimum qualification, need to receive local funding from your municipality, city, village, township, county, whatever. You have to have some sort of a budget. Um, cannot be just donations. There has to be an actual um, funding body. Uh, we already talked about, you have to have done the public library survey and the supplemental survey. You also have to have paid library staff um, during the, when the library is open. Now, we do understand that sometimes you do need to bring volunteers in to keep the library open when maybe the staff is at a meeting or at a conference. Um, board members may come in and cover sometimes, and that's perfectly fine. It's okay to have volunteers sometimes, but you do have to have paid library staff for the majority of the hours that the library is open. Uh, you cannot be a strictly uh, volunteer run library and be accredited. The director has to have an email address that they actually check. This may sound like a weird thing to say, but this is something we have struggled with. Um, and we still struggle with people not checking their emails and not notifying us of things and not seeing the notifications that we send out. So uh, make sure that you, this is how we reach out to you. This is how I contact you with anything related to accreditation, certification, anything. So make sure that you do keep up with your email. You are also required by state statute to make your basic services available free. This would be um, circulating, you know, letting out books, letting people use the materials in the library, doing research for them. Um, those kind of things. Now you can still charge for things, of course, like materials for a craft session, if there's a cost for that, or a fee because a speaker has a big fee and you want usually charge a little bit for people to attend. That's okay. 
those kind of things. But your basic services um, must be, be free. And we require that you provide internet to the and access the internet at no charge as well. No per minute costs, no per hour costs for um, using the internet. <clears throat> and your last minimum qualification, this is also per state statute. You must make an annual report to whoever your governing body is about what the library has done in the previous year. This is by statute due in February. So this would be in February, you'd make a report that was about what happened in the year before. Now we know sometimes it doesn't always work out at that timing, that's okay. Just at least do something annually that you're submitting something to your municipality, your governing body about what you're doing. <clears throat> and you'll see once you've um, clicked all 12 of those and meet all of them, then at the bottom it pops up that you can now apply for accreditation. And then that will ask for your user ID and password. As I said earlier, this is the same one that you use for Bibliostat to do your public library survey. Uh, if you don't remember that, don't know it, you can always look it up. So I have opened up a page here where I've already logged into a library's application. And I am using as an example, Ainsworth. Uh, Ainsworth is just happens to be at the top alphabetically by city uh, and uh, is due for reaccreditation in 2024. So it's convenient that um, we're just using them as convenience for demonstration purposes here today. I'm not going to actually submit this on their behalf at all. Uh, we're just going to use this to show you how the application form works. So when you first get in, and your application form will be personal to your library. So you should see your library name at the top when you log into your library's application. As I mentioned, there are some of the guidelines are pulled automatically from the public library survey. If you meet the guideline, you get a check mark. If you don't, you get a red X. You can see that well here you get your check mark because we click those 12 minimum qualifications but here's an example of um, according to the public library survey Ainsworth does not have a friends group but they do have a foundation so get a red x there and a green check there something i'll mention right here off the bat too is if you're looking at your application form here and you notice that some of this information is actually wrong some of these pre-filled answers we can change that you just let us know the public library survey is due in February, and then we open this process up in July. But you can submit the form, your survey, anytime between November and February. And we know, we understand that things may have changed since you submitted your survey, and that's okay. You can let us know that, oh, actually, since we did this, we did create a friends group. Someone did come create one, and we need to change that. Let us know behind the scenes, we will make that change, and we can change your red X to a green check mark and then you can earn those points for that item. So just let us know that you are, that something has changed. All right, back up here. Um, as I mentioned, your, you can see who your peer libraries are by clicking this blue button here. So you can see here Ainsworth falls in the middle. They have quite a few uh, that are larger than them and some that are smaller. These are all within 15% of them. So these are all the libraries that Ainsworth is compared to when the questions that are peer comparisons are entered, are pre-filled into their application form. If you have any questions about any of the accreditation form here you can ask me if you have questions about your peer data like i mentioned earlier you can ask sam something new we have on the form this year that i'm going to show you is we have some computer security related questions we've never had those before um, but andrew sherm sherman here at the library commission sherm has, has been helping libraries do this and struggling with it and he we decided we've talked about this for years decided to add some new computer security related questions you can ask him for details about that Look in the upper right here, there is a box that as you scroll down, you'll see it will float, there it is, and show you a running total of the points you've earned. As you click on things, you earn points, and as you unclick things, you um, deduct those points. So I click this first one, it goes up to 77, unclick, it goes back down to 67. So you can see as you're going um, how many points you've earned. There is the yellow question mark pop up that will open up here. Some of the criteria have question have uh, explanations and help, so you can always click on that wherever you see to get more of an in-depth explanation. 
At the very bottom of the form, I'm going to scroll down to it now. There are two buttons. You can, if you're totally done and ready to submit, you just hit submit. Or if you want to, you can save and come back later. If you, this is a long form, as you saw when I just scrolled through. And you can come back um, if you can get halfway through it or you, and you get interrupted or you need to go find some more information, look something up. You can save the form and come back later and continue where you left off. So it will save all and your anything you've checked off and you just pick up where you where you stopped. So if you're not totally done, just click that save and resume button. When you are totally done and ready to submit it, click the submit application button. Okay. And you can see on each question, it does tell you how many points each one is worth. So you can see what you will earn by checking those. All right, does anybody have any questions at the moment? Let me know um, before we get into all the details of the form here. And actually what I think I'm gonna do, because we're almost to 2.30, almost halfway through the workshop today, or I guess I'm running a little longer than, than expected. Um, I think, we'll take a break before I get into the application form. We talked a lot about accreditation to the form itself. So let me know, do you have any questions about what we've talked about so far? Type into the question section, let me know. Um, anything about the basics of accreditation, um, the levels, the requirements, certification, peer comparisons, anything that you um, are confused about or wanted to know more about, anything I haven't covered yet that you're wondering about, uh, please type into the question section. All right, um, let's take a break then. Uh, since it is almost 2.30, I don't wanna go too far um, into the forum. We can get through that and communities response planning in the second half of the workshop. Uh, we'll just take a five minute break. So it is 2.28 now. We'll come back at 2.33 central time. I'll come back. Um, so we'll just do a very quick Get up, stretch, refresh your drink, uh, hit the restroom, whatever you need to do. Uh, and we'll come back in five minutes to pick up the on the application form uh, and then talk about the community's response plan. Um, if you do think of any questions while we're on break, that's okay. Go ahead and type it in the question section um, and I will answer them when we come back. There I am again. <laughs> All right, it is 2.33 and we are back. So I'm going to pick up and talk about our accreditation application form. So uh, we've already met the 12 minimum qualifications and now we're gonna look at all the things you can earn extra points for or your additional points for. Uh, the pre-filled questions from the public library survey have brought in 67 points for this library. And now we get to click and add other ones. The first item here is having your community needs response plan. Um, this is something that does not have to have been submitted to me and approved, as I, this is something I did make a change to. Um, as I said, I need to look at this along with this application form. So you just need to have something submitted to me that has been done within the last five years. So if you have one that you've already worked on, uh, you don't have to start a new one just because you're due for accreditation. If it's, if it's the years it covers, covers this year, you can just send me something you already have. Um, I'll show you here first also, if you try and click anything else before checking that first, that second box, you will receive this notification, just reminding you that the community's response, community needs response plan is required. So um, if you have one or are working on one, you can go ahead and click that first box so that you are, can then continue through the rest of the form. Um, so it's okay if you click that, but you haven't gotten it to me yet, you're just trying to work through this form. Um, as you're going through it, that's perfectly fine. Um, if you review it annually, which you should, you can check that second box and then let us know, let me know when you did last, uh, did review it. Uh, next uh, criteria here, or guideline here is library policies. Uh, 
so we have a long list of policies. You can earn one point for each policy that you have. Uh, and I don't know what this library has done. I'm just gonna randomly uh, check things off here, uh, just to show you as you click each one, your points total goes up over here on the right. If you unclick something, it'll go down. So just click all the things that you have. You don't have to have these be their own individual policies. It could be part of some other policy. That's perfectly fine. Just as long as you have somewhere in writing that you do have a policy about something, what about these things. Uh, we also give you four extra options here in case you there's something you have a policy on that we have not listed. Um, if you type something in there, you can also earn points for those as well. Do you have a technology plan? Uh, technology plan is different from your community needs response plan. This is a plan that is about how you update your computers, how you update your networking on a regular basis. So this is the kind of thing you'd look at. You'd be looking at our computers get old every five years, we're gonna update them. And then every four years, we're gonna update our routers, et cetera, whatever you're going to do technology related. And then oh, I already showed you this, the Friends Group Foundation. This is automatically submitted through the NLC Supplemental Survey and automatically pre-filled. Second, second section of your application form is resources. So these are the um, resources you have that help you provide library service. And here at Local Income, this is your first peer comparison. So you can see here is the this library's local income, what the peer average is, and the peer median. You can you have to meet at one or the other of these, not both. In this case, they happen to um, are greater than both of them, but it can be either one of them. This is pre-filled from the Public Library Survey. Uh, facilities. What hours are you open? Uh, we do not require a minimum. You just need to be similar to, at least equal to or above your um, libraries in your similar size. Uh, have you asked recently what your library wants your hours to be? So does this reflect an attempt to meet the needs? Notice we say attempt. Just because you ask does not mean you have to change the hours. <laughs> uh, this is just, at least you know, put it on a survey or ask for something. And then does the library meet federal, state, and local codes for safety and access? I certainly hope everyone will check this, but we do have help that will pop up into, so you can check federal accessibility guidelines, America's Americans with Disability Act, um, safety guidelines, et cetera, et cetera. Staff, again, all as you can see all of these under staff pre-filled from your public library survey. Uh, expenditures are equal to, or this is expenditures on staff, so this is salary, benefits, etc. cetera. Uh, your library director must be certified at a particular level. Uh, director must be certified as a level based on the size that your library, community your library serves. So um, anything up to 2,499, you need to be a minimum level one, high school graduate or equivalent. And then it goes up by level depending on how big your population is. If you have additional library staff that are certified, you can earn points as well. Depending on your community size, you have to have a certain number of additional staff uh, certified. Uh, one, two, three, or four for the largest size community. Um, number of personnel that you have, number of full-time personnel, and then financial resources for your staff to do continuing education, to, do, to attend workshops, um, go to conferences, etc. So you have to have some sort of a line item in your budget that is this amount of money is set aside for that, or we have spent this amount of money to send them to this or to pay for a registration fee for something. Uh, technology is the next section. You can see a few of these things are carried over or automatically pre-filled from the public library survey. Do you have an integrated library system, ILS? Is it online? Uh, do you have broadband access at speeds adequate to meet user needs. Uh, now you'll notice that a lot of these questions on here are going to be um, you giving your opinion, you know, do you think it's adequate or not? And I trust you when you answer these questions. I'm trusting that you're answering these questions honestly and correctly. So uh, is everyone getting to things quickly enough, both for, and it's all user needs in library, not just um, your patrons, but also your staff. Is everyone able to get the websites need to quickly? Are your, your staff able to do their work, uh, cataloging work quickly enough? If your internet is slowing it down, that might not, probably not 
something you should check off and something you should look into um, improving. Do you offer Wi-Fi in the library? Do you have telephone service with voicemail or answering machine for people to contact you? Um, do you have additional technology accommodations for people with disabilities? So this isn't just meeting the minimum American with Disabilities um, Act, but things like screen readers or magnifying screen magnifiers or adjustable desks, those kind of additional um, resources. And an adequate number of computers that may be listed in your community's response plan or your technology plan. Are people waiting to use the computers for a long time? Are you getting a lot of complaints that there's always so many people on and there's not enough to go around? Then you probably don't have an adequate number. And now this next section here, these are new questions this year on the application form. This section is new. Um, and this is um, we're talking about your library's computer security, com security of your library's computers. And this will be both for public and staff computers. Uh, you can earn one point each for these top five of the first five. Uh, no, and we do have a lot of help here, so you can understand what we're talking about. Uh, no computers are running end-of-life operating systems. Um, for example, Windows 7 or 8. Uh, end-of-life, we have a help guide here. This means after a certain date, um, Microsoft, Apple, whoever, will stop support offering customer support for certain older operating systems. You have no one that you can con to contact. There'll be no security updates. Um, you really need to get the newest version. Um, right now, Windows 7 and 8 have reached end of life. Windows 10 will reach end of life in October 2025, so next year. So that's something you need to plan for. You need to be, as of October of next year, on Windows 11 or later. Um, are you updating the operating system and software at least monthly? Oftentimes, this is automatic. There's automatic updates. If not, make, make sure it's being done. Uh, do you have separate logins for staff and customers? Uh, Sherm has encountered too many times when he's been out there libraries who have as their uh, login for the computer admin, which is the default login, the word admin, A-D-M-I-N, which, and everyone knows that that's default, so any of your users, anyone using your library could get into um, and do nefarious things to your computer. Make sure you have separate logins. Do you have reboot restore software? Again, this pulls from the public library survey. We auto, can automate. We do ask that, so it can automatically be filled in. Um, this is software that, when your computer is shut down, when some after someone uses your computer, it restart, reboots the computer, and wipes out any of their logins. So if they went to their health, their banking, their bank website and logged in themselves, or um, health, uh, their health portal, re wipes out all of that, so nobody can get into someone else's account. Um, and then do you have password secured access to the computer's BIOS? Now this has an explanation because I know I'm sure many people would look at this and say, what does that mean? Uh, BIOS is software that has to do with the hardware on your computer. So um, do you have that locked down as well? Now we have a big explanation here so you can look into that. If you need help on doing this, Sherm is your guide. He's the one that helped us create these questions. If you want help on how to do any of these things, reach out to Sherm and he can do that for you. Our last two computer security questions are about um, filtering and firewalls. Do you use some sort of filtering to protect for, for web browsing? So this is blocking being access to illegal websites, pornographic websites um, for the purposes of complying with CIPA, the Children's Internet Protection Act, which you need to be in compliance for, for E-rate or for receiving federal grant funds. We do have a, service now since last year. This is another thing that Sherm set up where we can provide you with this filter for free. Um, DNS filtering, we have um, budget money in the budget here at the Library Commission where it, we um, contact Sherm. He can set you up for this and he will monitor and maintain this on your behalf. So if you do not have a filtering on your computer or you're not sure if you do or if you have one that you're having trouble working with, <laughs> reach out to Sherm and ask him about this, and he can get you set up with the free op filtering option that we offer through the Library Commission. And the last new computer security question is about having a next generation firewall. This is something beyond what your service provider may offer may um, offer for you. So there may be something that your service provider says, yeah, firewall is included, but you want something more complex, from them, you know, more robust than that. Um, 
These are things like from Cisco, Fortinet, you might recognize those names. We also have funding that can help you, that can pay for this as well. Uh, you may have seen a recent blog post from us from about the Medica Corporation giving us a grant to help libraries upgrade their networking equipment, the actual physical equipment in your library that helps the um, computer, the internet work. So your switches, routers, racks, cables, all of that. And firewalls um, count for that. So we, um, if you're not sure about if you have one of these, reach out to Sherm, <laughs> ask him. Uh, he will do a tech review for you and we can pay for that firewall. You would still need to have your own IT support for it, but we can at least get you the um, equipment. So that is our new questions, an additional 10 points that you can earn on your accreditation. Uh, collection is the next section. Do as your library, does anybody have any questions about those security questions? Those are new. I wanna make sure we all understand what's happening there. All right, if you ever think of anything, type it in. All right, collections. Uh, does your collection reflect the mission and goals of the library? Hopefully it does. <laughs> uh, check that box. Uh, how are you on weeding? This is also pulled from the public library survey, your weeding rate. Uh, library staff using online websites to provide information to library users. Are your staff going online and looking up information for them online? Um, how is your annual expenditure of materials as a percentage of operating expenditures? This is another one of our peer comparisons. Circul annual circulation of items per capita, peer comparison. Turnover rate in the collection. This is bringing in new things to the collection. Uh, peer comparison. And then collection size, items per capita. Another peer comparison. Next section is on services. What services do you offer? Um, outreach programs. Uh, this is would be uh, going out and bringing the library services to people who cannot come into the library. So doing a story time in a, in a uh, daycare or bringing books to the homebound or bringing books on a regular basis to the senior center, those kind of things. Do you use interlibrary loan services, either doing it yourself or having the library commission do it for you? We do have a um, service where if you do not have your own interlibrary loan service you can have us borrow books for you box items for you from other libraries if your patrons use them need them um, attendance at programs pulled from your public library survey peer comparison do you have library programs or services that target um, specific um, audiences um, that you may have listed in your community's response plan so if you're doing a particular programs for teens or seniors or toddlers or whatever the group is <laughs> after school kids, uh, you can earn points for that. Do you use the databases that we offer here through the Library Commission? That would be Nebraska Access. This is the databases that we receive information or funding from the state legislature to provide at no cost to libraries. Uh, and then you actually subscribe to additional databases uh, yourself uh, above and beyond what we offer free through the Library Commission. As you can see, pulled from your public library survey, you've already told us these. Uh, cooperation and collaboration. This is where we get into earning a lot of points for the kind of things where you're working with other organizations and other groups. Uh, does the library director or anyone on the library board attend at least two of your village, city council, county, whatever, board meetings every year? Uh, now, this does not necessarily be for the, you know, going to present reports and do things, but just being there, just having your body there in the room and them seeing you can make a difference in knowing that the library exists, that the library is paying attention, what's going on. Um, do staff participate in community organizations and groups? So to keep other the other organizations aware of that you are out there and exist. And we have um, help here for that one. Um, if you have at least four community groups that you are participating in, this would be like your service organizations, Rotary, Kiwanis, those kinds of things. Do you have a teen board? Uh, many libraries struggle with getting the teens to come into the library. You know, parents bring in their little kids, adults come in, but you kind of lose them sometimes in those teen years. Uh, many libraries have come up with doing having a separate board of teens that help 
um, inform them about what the teens want to do, what programs would like to have, what events, activities, um, if you have something like that at your library. Do you cooperate with other local entities for shared services? So now this one is specifically uh, not just providing services somewhere, but they are a, a co-sponsor of it. For example, um, the story walks that a lot of libraries are doing where you take a book apart and put it on posts and you walk and go to each page of the book. Many libraries are putting those up in the local park because they don't have the space, but they have a park. So that's something co-sponsored by both groups. Do your board members or, and or library staff participate in any advocacy efforts? So this would be attending Nebraska Library Association's annual advocacy day that's here in Lincoln, usually in March. Um, American Library Association's advocacy, advocacy efforts, there's things that are in person or online. Every Each person, you can have up to five people that might participate in any of those. And do you do any sort of group resource sharings that you're part of, um, consortias? Here through the Library Commission, we have the Overdrive Group for eBooks, Nebraska Card for getting a, a card where you can borrow books from other libraries, not your local community library. Um, the Pioneer Consortium, it's not run by the Library Commission, but it's a group of libraries that have a shared online catalog. Um, so that's a resource sharing group um, here in Nebraska, but it could be something na national, other regional, statewide. Um, anything that's um, going in on a group of libraries to help um, lower costs. And the final section of the application form is communications. How are you getting the news out, the word out about the things you do do at your library? Uh, do you post your mission statement and policies on the library website? Uh, do you have a library website would be a question too. Um, if you do not have a library, some libraries have a website some have a page on the city's website if you don't have one and you're looking for one we also offer for free uh, wordpress websites for public libraries in nebraska called our nebraska libraries on the web program program amanda sweet who's our technology innovation librarian is in charge of that so if you would like to have a library website reach out to her look on our website on our for information about it and we can get you one so do you post that your mission statement, all those policies that you checked above on your library website? Uh, do you have any sort of social media you're using um, you, and you let that have, so that people can interact with you online? So on your website, having a blog that people can comment on using Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, whatever the next social media thing someone will invent, invent. <laughs> um, let us know here which ones you are on. Now, as I mentioned earlier, many of the guidelines here in the application form are on the honor system. I'm going to trust that you say you do the things you do, that you participate in certain programs, that you have certain things that you do. I don't go and search out every single program you offer. But for things that I can check on like this, like do you have a website and are these policies and mission statement listed there? And are you posting on your social media at least once a month? I will check on this. I will go and look for your library website. I will go look for your social media accounts and make sure you're using them. If you haven't posted something since like 2014, just because you have the Facebook page or the Twitter account, that doesn't count. You have to be using it actively to be really making, uh, making it, getting the word out about what's happening in the library. And if I don't find these, I will reach out to you and ask about it. Why is your not your mission statement there? Why are your policies missing? and I will give you a chance to get them on there. I will give you a chance to start posting on your social media. Um, you know, we, you're due to submit all these things by October 1st, but we have till the end of the year for us to go back and forth on fixing things, updating things um, before we make the final determination about your accreditation. So I will give you a chance to um, earn the points. Social media is great, but there are other ways to promote that um, people will still use and want to see you um, in. So newsletters, you have a local newspaper, radio station, uh, putting posters or flyers up um, in any of the local businesses, putting announcements in the local, in the bill, um, bills that are sent out, utility bills, any of those ways, do you use any of that? Do you have a place in your library where you can put up exhibits or displays of things? Does someone in the community or a staff member have a collection of teacups and they want to show them off? Here's my 50 teacups I've collected over the years. Do you have somewhere where they, you display those kind of things? 
Do you have a bulletin board that you let the public use? So this is working, helping, working with your public. So uh, not just where you post things, but you let people put things up like car for sale, lost dog, et cetera. Do you do a report, usually monthly, but it will depend on when these meetings happened, to your village, city, village board, city council, uh, county board, whatever it is, regularly. So letting them know regularly. So this is not just attending the meetings as we talked about before, but actually reporting on um, what you do. Um, do you post these reports on your website? So again, I will look at your library website and see if your monthly statistics, reports, whatever are um, posted there. And do you communicate with business leaders, civic organizations? So not just attending their meetings and showing that like we're here, but sending an email to the head of the Kiwanis saying, hey, we wanna do a summer reading program and we would like to see if you want to donate prizes. So reaching out to them or, hey, we're doing this program for seniors and just sending it to the senior center to just let them know that is that it exists. So reaching out to them proactively. Oh, and we do have a question that just came in about the reports that you do. Are monthly board minutes provided to city council count as monthly communication or does it have to be in person? Monthly board minutes. Oh, so you submit your report. Oh, someone else says they do this. They Every month we do, if a, the library board has a meeting and that talks about everything the library has been doing. We then send that to the city village board. Um, yes, that would be reporting to them. Um, it does not have to be standing up in person at the meeting, no. Um, just sending them the minutes that are already done from a board meeting would definitely count for that. Yes. All right. Uh, and then that's the bottom of the form. You can see our points have been totaling up over here in the top right. They're also down here at the bottom. Um, it automatically fills in your library director's info and we've got 238 points, which gets to get you to silver. Um, as I said, I don't know if this library Ainsworth does all these things. I just randomly checked stuff as I was going through demoing this. <laughs> Uh, if we are done and ready to submit this, you would hit the submit application button and that would be sent to me. If you still need to go back and fix things or change things or you're just halfway through it, you do the save and resume later and come back and pick up where you left off. Um, I am not going to submit this because I'm not going to submit this on Ainsworth's behalf. I'm going to let them do their own thing when the, <laughs> the form goes live and they can do their accreditation form. All right, does anybody have any questions about the application form? Uh, please type into your question section. Are there any guidelines that you wanted to know more about? Any that I haven't explained clearly? Any specifics that about your library that you wanted to know more about a uh, particular um, item? No? All right. So that is the first thing that you have to submit to be reaccredited or to be accredited for the first time. There we go here, your application form. Well, we, we'd we already done that. So in order to apply, getting here to our most important part here about being accredited, you've already done that survey and the supplemental one earlier. We met the 12 minimum qualifications, your application form. Uh, now, the other, th the last thing you need to do is a community needs response plan, and we are going to talk about that now. Oops. So we're going to switch gears and talk about this plan. Uh, to that, to that. Okay. Cool. So, um, community needs response plan is a separate document that you send to me. It is not an online form that you fill out. 
Um, we have some guides and worksheets you can use here on the page, but you send this to me. It can be a Word document, a PDF, whatever. Uh, you can email it to me as an attachment, mail it, fax it, whatever works for you to get your plan to me. If you have a current plan, you don't need to write a brand new one from scratch. You can just um, update the current one that you have. If you're not sure if you had a previous plan or you can't find it because it's been so long, you know, as I said earlier, everybody, lots of people's <coughs> um, accreditation years have ex been ex um, extended. So it may have been a while since you've worked on one of these. Uh, or if you're the new library director, so you did not, uh, don't know where the old one is, uh, reach out to me and ask. I may have a copy of it here that you sent to me previously and I can look and I can send you that. So the purpose of doing this community's response planning is to get you thinking outside the box, get you thinking about things that are not the usual typical things that a library may part may service that a library may provide. You know, we as library staff, we know the kind of things we usually do. We know what we, we think we know what our community needs and wants, uh, but we may be surprised. So we're going to try and look at some traditional things, non-traditional things that you might get um, involved in, um, that you might be able to do. And through this community needs response planning, you can find out what those are and possibly come up with some new services or programs or resources that you may offer. Uh, this community needs response plan was previously called a strategic plan. So you, your previous version may be called that, you may hear it called that uh, from other people. We changed the name of it a couple of years ago. This was um, an idea, well, this came from Scott Childers, again, uh, executive director of our Southeast Library System. Strategic plan is was very intimidating to some people. Um, when you think of a strategic plan, you think of this is the entire plan for the whole library for everything we do, and that's a lot. Um, that's not what we want here. We kind of, we want a small kind of subset of that. This is to be something separate, something different. And as we were talking about it, he said, "Well, this is what I tell people. It is. It's a community needs response plan because that's what you're really doing. You're creating, writing up, a, creating a plan to respond." to the needs of your community. You're researching what they want, coming up with some services and programs you can offer based on the resources. So we changed the name to Community Needs Response Plan. It is a mouthful, but it is much more accurate to what um, we're actually looking for. There are seven elements that must be in your plan, and we're gonna go into the details of these here. So you have to have all these seven things somewhere in your plan. Um, a mission statement stating uh, what you're, uh, we mentioned that you saw, remember that was in your application form as well. Do you have a mission statement it is on your library website? You should review this every now and then just to make sure that it's still valid and accurate. Uh, community profile, what makes your community unique? Uh, this is be looking at demographics, trends. We're going to look at census data uh, for that. An assessment of your community needs. What's going on in the community? What are people saying they need? Um, this is something that can be a little difficult for libraries to get the right answers from people and for people to give the right answers. Uh, as you're 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 going to reach out and ask, um, you're going to be looking for what not what the library needs, what the library wants to provide, but what the community needs. So looking outside the library walls. You know, like I said, what we want to do, but looking just outside and seeing what's happening out there, what's happening out in my community, is there anything that the library can respond to uh, to help? Now, many things you can't do anything about, the potholes or too, there's too many potholes in town, that's not anything the library can do something about, but there may be some things you might realize you can do. Um, an analysis of the library's strengths, resources, and barriers or opportunities for improvement. Um, we're going to get into the details of all this, so this is just a quick overview we're doing right now. So this is just looking at the library itself. What are things, good things about the library, bad things about the library, um, being honest about what is going on there. And then you're going to take these three things, your demographics, your what the community needs, what the library is good or bad at, and get them all together to do an analysis of what this means. What can the library, and think about what can the library do? What can they um, do about this? Is there anything? And you're going to come up with some goals. Uh, 
ideally three different things that you're going to either expand on a current program, create a new program, try and offer a new service, help with something. just different things you can do now you're going to possibly come up with lots of things the library can do and there are lots of services and programs the library offer beyond these three we're just using this process here to think outside the box think outside the library and come up with some new things that keep you know what the library is offering new and fresh and you only need to tell me about three things not every single thing the library is doing i know you're doing summer reading that's great come up with you know tell me something new that you came up with after, by looking and seeing what the community was asking for um and then an evaluation plan an evaluation of how these uh goals that you've come up with are going and an evaluation of the plan itself basically we're going to look at this this should be a living document something you look at regularly that you refer back to to make sure are these goals and programs are we doing them how are they going do we need to change do we need to switch gears um, so this is something you would look at regularly. This should not be something you write this year because I'm making you do it for accreditation and then don't look at it again for another five years when you're up for reaccreditation again. That's not the purpose of this. This is something you will not look at every day, but look at those goals and decide, okay, now let's figure out the day to day of how this is going to happen. And then refer back to what your measure, what your objectives were. Did we meet them? Are we, should we, should we need to switch gears? What's going on? We have some resources here that can help you with all of this. Uh, some webinars that were done. Uh, we did it when the 2020 census was done. We brought had a staff person from there come and do an, an Encompass Live for us on how to use that. Uh, uh, webinar about community engagement. Um, a couple of webinars about strategic planning. I know, I know, I said this is not a strategic plan, <laughs> but you can still look at strategic planning as a way to, you know, um, just the concept of it to think about when you're doing this. Um, we actually, yes, this morning's Encompass Live was about does your library need a strategist? Again, strategic planning. Um, we're gonna, I'm gonna add that once I have the recording process, it's gonna go up here as well. Uh, that was a really good session also about just thinking about things in your library and planning and innovating. Uh, so that is something that will be very useful as well. So look for that recording to come up. Uh, by the end of the day tomorrow. We also have examples of other libraries' plans that they've submitted to me. Um, you'll see there's a little break here that some are pre-2022. We did, I did change some of the, one of the sections here. So you're gonna have older versions and newer versions. They're all still totally valid. Um, and these are our plans that I've determined are good examples of plans. There is no requirement for how long your plan should be or how many pages. Um, here's the one from Keene Memorial Library in Fremont. They have a cover page, table of contents, and it's a total of nine pages long. Um, if we look at Shelby's, let's see theirs. They're gonna have to update theirs soon. Um, also has a cover page, I and mean, then it just goes right into the plan itself. No table of contents, perfectly fine. Um, I think there's another one that has, yeah, here is, um, where am I here, Clay Center has their plan, it's actually 15 pages long for the same amount of content. So there's no minimum, there's no specific format. It can be whatever you want. If you want to, definitely you can use any of these plans as a template for your own. Make sure you update it with your library's information. These are ones that I've pulled out that were good examples of the plan. Now to, to write, to do your plan, you do need, um, there's many ways that you can do it. <laughs> uh, we have, as I said, if you already have a plan, you already have a way to do it, just go ahead and do it. That's perfectly fine. But we do have some resources here that can help you um, do that if you want to. Uh, there's worksheets here. I'm gonna go through all of these. There's worksheets, there's guides, there are, um, help information all sorts of things here that can help you do this so there is this is one way of doing it a uh, way to get there it's not the only way um, as long as you end up with something that has these seven item um, elements as part of it you can do it however works for you 
I'm going to show you just some resources we have here available to help you do that. If you if you want to use them, you are welcome to do so. These are kind of if you have no clue where to start, you're starting from scratch. These are some good guides that can help you. So we do have this uh, communities response planning in 12 step. So 12 step program <laughs> for it. And you can see here, this has different things you will do throughout the process. And it refers to some worksheets and help guides. These are the things we have on our, um, on the website there. So this is kind of, this can be kind of your one page that helps you keep track of all the things we want to do or need to do uh, to end up with a plan in the end. So first you need to uh, plan to plan. <laughs> um, you need to have a team of people to help you with this. Do not do this on your own. Our worksheet here has, oops, it went over there. Let me open this up a little bigger as so you can see it. There we go. Uh, this worksheet here, you can see it keeps track. Um, you can, this is something you can also keep track of all the individual things you're going to be doing. What you're going to do, who's going to be the people that do it, a start date, a target finish date. Did you actually complete it? Uh, a lot of these target dates, you're going to have to change them up as you go through the process. You realize, oh, it's not going to happen yet, and that's fine. So this is just something where you can keep track of all those steps um, specifically that you're doing. Your planning team. You should always have a team. Do not go this at this alone. Um, if you are the library director or if you are the library board president who's been put in charge of doing, making sure the, the library does accreditation, having other staff or library board members or community members involved can give you a lot of good input and advice. You don't want to be the only person taking all of this on your shoulders. Uh, we also it's also a bad situation for the future if someone else needs to then work on this plan. Nobody knows if you did it all on your own. Nobody knows what happened. We had a library in the past uh, years ago where I had a group of people who had come to a workshop, and they the library had been accredited for a long time, but they had no idea what was going on with their accreditation because the previous director, who had since left the library, um, had done it all on their own. They had done the application, done the community's response plan, at that time was a strategic plan, uh, didn't talk to anyone about it, nobody knew what they had written, why they had included, what they included, uh, the goals or the um, programs they're doing, where they got the statistics and the data, how that all happened. The library directors did it all alone. So this team came to the accreditation and said, we have no idea what happened before, we don't even know where to start, we don't even know where this plan is. <laughs> Our, it was never mentioned to us that it was something that need, that was done. Don't be that person. That's just putting too much on yourself, not necessary. Ask um, a library staff member, one or two, it doesn't have to be everybody to participate, just someone who's wanting to be involved in the process. Um, a library board member, possibly. One board member can be part of the team just to, to you know, have board input and connection. Are there anyone in the community, really, like your super users, someone who um, you know would give good input on what the library is doing because they know what's going on in the library? Um, or people who don't use the library yet, uh, people in, the, in, the, in your community who are major stakeholders, they could donate money to the library. They are big in the community and it might be good to get them on your side or you can show them and say, go to them and say, hey, we're doing this plan, trying to see what the library can do for the community and for you. We'd love your input on it. So look to see who you can have on your team. Size of this team, we don't want it too small or too big. And what does that mean? The example here says anywhere from five to 12 people. I think 12 is a lot. It depends on how big your community is, of course. But you want enough people where you have some varying ideas that people can bounce off of each other. And you can divide up the work, too. There's going to be various things you're going to need to do, looking up demographic information, doing surveys, um, writing up goals. You might want to divide that work amongst various people. And you're going to have to make sure that someone, who possibly the library director, board president, whoever is more in charge, can keep these people working together. Uh, there's going to be competing opinions. There's going to be people that are have louder voices than other people. And you're going to want to make sure that you let the quiet, help the quiet people. You know, be a facilitator. 
Um, not everyone's going to be happy. And no one's going to have all of their ideas included, but someone's going to be need to be there to, you know, herd these cats, so to speak. So be aware that is something that you would uh, need to do. Um, we do have an example here for that mission statement. If you don't already have one for your library, some information about what that is for, and some examples from other libraries, it's really just a short thing. Then you know, what is our vision for the library? Why are we here? What is our purpose? Etc. So get your team together, figure out your mission statement, and then start looking at uh, your community profile, uh, demographics. This is where you're gonna look at census data or any other resources that provide this kind of information about your community. We have a worksheet here that you can use, and it is a blank sheet where you can enter information from a public library survey or from the US Census Bureau. Uh, you do not have to fill out every single part of this. You do not have to submit this to me. This is just for you to gather the numbers. After you have these numbers gathered, you're going to go look at them and evaluate them and see what they tell you in general about your community. But these are all the kind of things you could find in census data. Um, obviously, age, population, education. Uh, when you get down to here, obviously, you'll have to fill this out yourself. This is not the kind of thing that will be in census data, but what are the facilities that the school has, what higher education institutions institutions are in your community or nearby, um, work life information, household economics, economic characteristics of the community, you can get that from census data. So this is all a bunch of things that you can um, want to gather together, gather up this kind of data to help you inform you about who is in your community, who they are, and um, what uh, what they're like, what your community is like. Now to do, we also have a companion sheet for that. It's the same exact worksheet, but it has our statewide figures. Sam Shaw puts this together for me every year. And he pulls this from the public library survey and the census data. Um, as you know, we have a census every 10 years, but in between censuses, the US, the Census Bureau does American community surveys where they do estimates. So in between, they gather data as well to keep things more up to date. So if there is a recent one here, he's used that to give more recent numbers, more recent than the 2020 census. So you have all of this data here, numbers here for the state as a whole. So you can compare your um your community to the state as a whole if you want to now obviously things like describing schools and stuff they, they this isn't here because this is for the state as a whole but just the data the statistics the numbers are in here for you now how can you get this data uh as i said the u.s census and the american community survey are two online places where we do you can access this american community survey uh, has profiles and data. As I said, this is for in between the censuses. You can look up all of these different profiles um, on the website and narratives and comparisons um, from the American Community Survey. Um, I'm going to show you how to use the census data. I do recommend, if you really want to dig into this, watch the webinar that we that was done about accessing census data. That goes into much more detail than I'm going to do today. I'm just going to give you kind of general, uh, quickie look at it. But the U.S. Census Bureau has, uh, they've updated their website. It's really nice, uh, clear, clean um, page that they have here now. And as I said, the census is done every 10 years, and this is where you can gather, get all of the data they have gathered. They have tables, they have maps that you can create, um, spreadsheets from different congressional areas, um, other data. They've got help guides and how to, how to use it on their own website as well. So many resources here. Okay. Um, but very simply, we can just type in our community name and see and look up our data. Now, the reason you wanna do this is you wanna see what the trends are, what's happening. Uh, you may have people who say, 
oh, I know we have these kind of um, immigrants coming in or we no longer have these kind or nobody's having babies anymore in our community. It's all old people. And that's just, you know, people's opinions or their feelings about what they think. You can get the actual numbers here, you know, verify what people claim is, is happening. So since we've been using Ainsworth to look at, uh, we're going to type them in, they use them as well for this. Um, I'm just going to type in Ainsworth to start with, and you can see I just typed in the name, the beginning name of the city, and it came up with Nebraska, Iowa, uh, Wisconsin. So depending on your city, that might get you to your city's info. In this case, it did. I've got Ainsworth City, Nebraska right there, but you might need to add yourself city and Nebraska if it doesn't come up with um, your city, you know, the, the Nebraska one of yours. So just pay attention to whatever pops up before you um, pick one. So we're going to pick Ainsworth here and it's going to take a second or so to, oh, that was fast. All right. So you can see here total population in Ainsworth and it does tell you here it was from the 2020 census, 1,616. Um, you can see down here there's different tables for things, race, uh, demographic and housing estimates you can see here this is those estimates and it says tells you this is from the american community survey age and sex in the american community survey etc cetera, etc cetera. so when you per, um report these in your community needs response plan to me make sure you cite where you're getting the data from population is 1616 from the 2020 census and then if you happen to use this demographic and housing one you'll say it's from the American Community Survey, just so I know where you are gathering, um, getting this data from. So you have all these tables you can open up and look at if you want to. They have maps you can look at that will map it out in your area um, for your community. They've got some related searches over here, so they're kind of prompting you with, do you want to know more about education in Ainsworth or health or housing or income and poverty? They will automatically bring those up for you. Uh, what I like to look at to start with is this profile here. This is kind of like gathering everything into one, you know, all the basics into one spot. So it's a good place to start. Um, you've got some of the basic percentages and numbers here, but if you click view profile, it'll bring up a page that will dig, have those for you. So population, employment, families and living arrangements, income and poverty, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, they have, yeah, man, load it. There's a map of Ainsworth there. This has taken a while to load. There we go. <laughs> uh, they do bar graphs here. Um, here about ancestry. Lots of German uh, populate people who are of German descent in um, Ainsworth and uh, Irish next. Go Irish. Uh, lots of Polish and English. Uh, a little bit of Scottish and Norwegian too. Um, you can see what languages are spoken. Um, English primarily, a so little Spanish and some other Indo-European languages. So you can see all of this, and then here's your population. Are you skewing older, um, younger, um, mobility, et cetera, et cetera. So you can look at all of these different things for uh, Ainsworth. And you can be able to pull all of this into that spreadsheet or that worksheet. Now, you may not just serve your own community. Uh, you know, Ainsworth is the name of the library and that's their basics, but you probably know there's not just people from Ainsworth are coming into your community. There may be people from the whole county. There may be someone from the town down the road. Uh, there may be something down like here. Uh, you can see Ainsworth is on Route 20. The next community over might not have a public library, so they come to yours. Look up that city's uh, data as well, because they are your users too. Just because you say we are we serve the city of Ainsworth that our legal service area is these borders, you know that other people are still coming in though. So look up that city's data. Look up your county data. Uh, we know that Ainsworth is in Brown County, so we're gonna do Brown County. Let's see. So see there, it didn't bring up Nebraska, Wisconsin, Ohio, Texas, other places. So I'm gonna add Nebraska. There we go. And then we can go to the county data. So if you're the only library in your county and you know people in the whole county are coming, then um, you're going to want to look at that data as well. So total population in the county is 2,903. 
and then you have the same thing tables related searches profile but this is all just county level and sometimes it takes a little time for it to come up and that's okay <laughs> Does anybody have any questions about getting your demographics or um, looking up census data? Now, as I said, this is a general, a quickie overview. Check out that webinar, look at their own help. Yeah. All right. We do have a question here. Um, let's see. Uh, what if your our community, our city has already done a, a survey? Has done this already? Has this? Yeah. Has, you know, the census happened in 2020. What if our city has put this out already themselves? That is okay. You do not have to. Don't reinvent the wheel. If this has already been gathered up together, some some one either at the county or the city level has said, here is a, a census report for our community. Just get a copy of that report. Don't look it up yourself. Don't go. To, don't put yourself through all that. If someone else has already um, gathered up that data, you know, it's been a few years since the U.S. Census, since the 2020 census, so possibly that has been done. Ask around, see if there is somewhere where you can just get a copy of that, and that is perfectly fine. You do not have to go ahead and gather all this yourself if someone else has already done it and put it together a nice pretty report just get a copy of that report and use that all right so that's your community profile next you're going to look at the community needs what is happening in your community what do they want what's good what's bad etc so we have some uh, we have a worksheet here of ways that you can uh, assess your community needs, but we all, and we'll get into that in just a second. But we have some some more write-ups about why you would do this. Uh, resources to help you do a needs assessment, surveys, uh, recommended suggested survey questions, doing focus groups, community meetings. So um, definitely look into these if you want some more information about how to do that. Um, information about running a focus group. So as I said, these community, there's various ways that you can gather this information. The goal is what's important, not the method. Um, what you're trying to find out is um, what, what are people looking for? What do they want? What do they need? Um, Oh, someone says their community has done a community assessment, community needs assessment uh, the less recently, and can they just use that? Yes, absolutely. Uh, don't, again, similar to the census information, don't reinvent the wheel. <laughs> if there is already a report out there, um, for example, for some reason, New York City has done in the last, it has to be something I would say within the last five years, you don't want something too old or much older than, older than that, because you want it to be recent, valid information and questions. Um, if there's already been a community needs assessment done for so-and-so town, just get a copy of that report and use it. Don't do a new focus group. Don't ask community new questions or surveys if it's already been asked, asked and answered. Just take what's already out there and use it. Absolutely. That will make this section so much easier for you. <laughs> um, if you don't have that, you will need to try and gather this information somehow. And there are various ways to do this. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, when you're talking to your community, they may get, whether you're doing a focus group and interview with an individual, um, a survey, surveys are a little easier, uh, they're going to get possibly confused by the library is asking me these questions. The library must want to know what I think of the library. So I'm going to tell them, I love the library does this. I don't like you do that. I wish you could offer more of this. And that's fine let them get that out of their system but what you're looking for is what do they think of the community they need to also think outside the library not this is not asking what do you want from the library this is asking what do you want from your community and we have some sample questions here that can guide them to that so things like how satisfied are you with living in our community what do you like most about the community least um, what's the most critical issue facing the community 
et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so you will have to possibly guide them to where we know what you, you want to talk about the library and that's a separate discussion <laughs> right now we want it to see we're doing a community needs assessment so what's what's outside the library it may some of the it may answers may be the library but you want them to um, think beyond think about other things so when doing let me get back here uh, focus groups, that is one way to do this. Um, if you are happy and good with doing this, uh, being the facilitator for a group of people, you can make it be an open focus group. Anyone who wants to come to a meeting and talk about the community, show up. You can invite specific people if you want to. You will have to possibly, uh, just like when you, we're, you're having a people who are on your team, uh, people who monopolize the discussion, people who are quieter, you'll have to make sure everyone gets to have their say. Uh, don't let anyone you know, just sit there and not say anything. Um, you know, try and engage as many of people as you can. A uh, good thing, you can bribe people with food to get them to come to these meetings. It's always a good idea, good thing that it brings people in. Um, so then you just ask those questions of people as a group. Uh, you could do what they call key informant interviews, someone who has influence in your community, uh, someone who is very active in the community, uh, the superintendent of schools, the head of a parent group, head of a religious group, whoever. Um, they can work a little, this can work a little better than doing a survey or a focus group because you can pick who will be in the group or pick specifically who you want to talk to and have more of a personal one-on-one -on -one conversation with them. Um, you can ask them, you know, what does your specific group need in the community? What does this, you know, the parent group, the school, the, school, the uh, religious group, what do they specifically need rather than just opening up to, in general, what do you think of the community? Um, you can do a survey, online survey using something like an online resource like SurveyMonkey, uh, paper survey, um, whatever uh, you are comfortable with. Um, you can put out flyers saying, here, we're doing a survey, um, pass those around town. Uh, some communities I know have recommended putting them in the, you know, the water bill, utility bill goes out to everyone, have a little flyer that says the library, we're doing a survey of community needs, go to this URL and enter, um, you know, give us your info. Uh, you can uh, work with a chamber of commerce, or if a school or church newsletter goes out, ask them to promote to promote it. That's good ways of getting the survey out. Uh, so this would be more of an anonymous uh, answer, so they wouldn't have to um, be right there. You know, focus groups, they're right there. Key informants are right there in front of you. Anonymous surveys. And then just walking around yourself and just seeing, you know, knowing, you know, walking around and seeing, hey, I noticed that the the dog park is looking terrible or there's a lot of people with dogs. They have nowhere to go. <laughs> uh, maybe we need a dog park, things like that. So anything that you also can just walk around is totally valid too. just write your notes. You know, take it, take a walk around town one day for the purpose of seeing how the city looks, seeing how things are going. All right, so that's your community needs assessment. Uh, next, uh, we have taking stock of your library. And this is the section that I had changed. Uh, I talked earlier about there's these pre-2022 examples and posts. Previously, this was the SWOT analysis. Strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And we had it separated out from strengths and weaknesses of the library and opportunities and threats from outside the library in the community. And it was either very stressful for some people, some people don't like doing SWOT analysis, it's, it's too much, it's for businesses and I don't like doing them. Um, and it was getting confusing with, this is internal, just about the library strengths and weaknesses, because normally you do a SWOT about your organization, your entire organization. And it was strengths and weaknesses of the library, opportunities and threats outside the library. Can't talk about the library with those. We just want you to think outside. And I decided to change that up and say, we really want you to take stock of your library and how it relates to the community. So we're going to not do uh, SWAT anymore. Um, we have a little description here of what we are wanting you to look at. 
Um, this is something beyond just the numbers, uh, beyond just the statistics. So you're going to do some brainstorming. Um, so we've got some guide there, but then we have our worksheet here that is going to be what you can use. Uh, you can do this yourself. You can do this with your staff, with your board, um, with people in the community. So where you want to take what you know about the library and figure out which box it fits in. Um, and then this will help you um, inform your goals. It will help you decide, oh, we have this good strength that we're doing, we're, we're, we're struggling, we have a barrier in this area, we could really improve this thing, that's maybe that's something we could do um, as a new goal. So we'll just brainstorm here and then later on you can discuss it with your team or work it out yourself and refine it into something actually useful and actionable. So you can see here to start with, we've got uh, things that are obviously related to the library and then so then it goes out into things in the community. How is the technology in the community? Is there internet somewhere else or not? Uh, so we're talking about the strengths of the library. What is the library really good at? What resources do you have that you can use? Uh, what barriers do you have to doing any of these things on the first column here? And is there any areas that you could improve in? So for human resources, for example, director, staff, and volunteers. A strength could be we have really good volunteers. They'll come in and do something anytime, anywhere. <laughs> um, facilities, it could be anything about the building, about the um, ADA compliance, parking, location. Um, an opportunity for improvement could be parking. We don't have any parking near the library. We're on this main street and there's no parking lot. Is there somewhere we can do, you know, is there an open space next to us for a parking lot? Does the library need to move somewhere better for a parking lot? Uh, technology in the library. How are good are our computers and our internet? Uh, this is, um, we have um, really good internet. Uh, our barriers to having a makerspace is money. We don't have the funds to buy any of these things. So an opportunity for improvement in that area is we could apply for grants. We could do other things. So there could be multiple boxes that you fill in for some of these. Um, and then you just go through all of them and just, you might not have something for every item here. You see, I do have an other. Is there something else you think of that's a really a good thing the library does? A strength, a weakness, a barrier you're facing. Um, so just fill this out, brainstorm it. Um, sometimes it's hard for us to uh, um, praise ourselves. <laughs> uh, so pat yourself on the back. If you're really good at something, you think the library's good at something, say it, put it on here. Also though, with your barriers and your opportunities for improvement, things that you're struggling with, be honest with yourself. It can be hard, but um, just put it down there and get it out there and you know see what you can do with that. Uh, for the things having to do with the community as, it's, uh, as a, um, itself, the economy, technology, social climate, um, this could be things like there's an employer leaving the community and what's that gonna, effect going to have? Um, there's a new employer. Maybe if there's a new employer, an opportunity is that um, is opportunity for improvement is that we could offer um, resume writing services, bring someone in to help library do a, a workshop on that. So things just to look at out in the community. All right, so once you have um, taken stock of your library, you figured out what the community needs are, and you have your community demographics, then you can take all of that information and distill it down to some goals, some objectives, some things you might do. Now you're gonna come up with a lot of needs, possibly a lot of things that are lacking at the library or lacking in your community or things that you can work with, but only want you to pick three. So if you look at this worksheet, you'll see it has three community needs. What are you going to do about that and what's your ultimate objective going to be? So I just need you to pick three things to do. And that's what this purpose of this plan is, is just you thinking in this way. Um, and this will be the only three things with this plan that you'll have to you know, follow through with for this purpose. Um, and to do a good way to do this is to use what we call SMART goals. Uh, SMART is an acronym for um, a way to write something that is actually useful, something that you can actually go with, and will actually come out with something um, something good that you can work on. 
Uh, and SMART is an acronym that stands for Specific, Measurable, Attainable, Relevant, and Time Framed. So uh, for specific is what are you doing? What's the, what's the issue that you're covering? that you're trying to hand, take care of. Well, that's obviously you've come up with from those community needs. What's what's happening in the community? Uh, maybe you found out that um, through the demographics that actually there are tons of babies being born. Uh, three different daycares have opened in town and maybe we could offer an extra service to them. We'll bring our story time to the daycare rather than having them bring have to figure out bringing all the kids to the library. We'll do outreach and go there with story time. Cool. Uh, measurable has to be something that you can um, take statistics, statistics on. How many live places have we gone to? How many children were there? Did we loan out from books we were there? How frequently did we go to these places? So gathering some statistics. Um, attainable has to be something you can actually do. Uh, don't overreach. Don't say, we're going to go to every single daycare five days a week. That's a lot. And your staff will probably um, rebel against you on that. So something that is actually something you can achieve, maybe two or three days a week, depending on your staff and your time. Start out with something you can actually do. Um, it has to be relevant, relevant to your goals, uh, your staff responsibilities. You'll see this does say university, we borrow this from the university, but you can just you know apply it to library. Um, obviously, if you're using all the data you gathered, it should be relevant. If you used your community demographics, your community needs, and your library's um, taking stock of what your library has to offer, it should definitely become relevant. And then time frame. You have to have dates on here. Now, these are not going to be specific dates you have to all, you know, adhere to, but you do have to think about when are we going to do this and how much time is it going to take to do this. So you could say, we are going to start a uh, story time at the daycares within the next six months. We got time in the next six months to do that. Or you could say, in 2025, we are going to do this. In 2026, it depends. Um, your community's response plan generally would be a five year, cover five years. Uh, that's what we recommend. So you could have things that are going to happen any time in those five years. And you can decide, we've got three different goals, can't do them all at once, but we'll do one this year, one the next year, one the next year. And that's perfectly fine, but you do have to mention that in your the goals part of your plan. This is when we're planning on doing this. Now, those dates will change. I guarantee it. Uh, things are going to come up. Something's going to go wrong. Something's going to go really right, and you're going to do it more quickly than you thought. Um, they're, you know, you're just going to have to, you know, it's, it's okay. They are not in stone. They, you will be adjusting them. Um, part of your plan is that evaluation where you will every year check up on it and see how are things going? Are we ready to do that thing? Something may have come up and you have to bump something to another year and that's okay. These dates, this plan, it is not in stone. And if you don't get it done, the time you said you were going to, that's okay. So you have your goals and objectives. And then the last worksheet here is your evaluation. So this is both evaluating the goals and the programs or whatever you've done and the plan itself. How often will you look at this plan? Ideally, we recommend once a year, uh, the library director or the library board will take a look at it, have it be like a recurring item on your agenda for the board. You know, every March meeting, we'll look at this. Is this happening? Do we do it? Do we need to not do it? Whatever. Um, yeah. And then lastly, there is this summary sheet, and this is a worksheet that you can use. If you have, if you fill in every part of this sheet using all of those previous worksheets, you will have a community needs response plan with all seven of the items that are required. So the dates of the plan, as I said, should cover a five-year period. So if you're writing it now, it might start in 2024, it might start in 2025, depending on when you want to have it go into effect. Who is on your team? A uh, summary of the demographics and all of those the data that you um, gathered. So you would take this. If you look at some of those examples, people of libraries have generally put it into paragraph forms. Based on the 10 2020 U.S. Census, uh, according to the 2020 U.S. Census, the population of so-and-so is this, 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 this. Uh, summary of your needs, um, of the community needs. So using your community needs assessment, whichever way you did it, whether way you gathered it. Um, 
prioritize things, see what are people mostly talking about and least often talking about. Uh, a summary of your taking stock of the library, what you thought was good, bad, barriers, opportunities for improvement, and then the goals that you came up with. Based on all this info that we have, we've decided to do these three new things. Or we decided to expand, decided to expand a program we currently have. We decided to do some research on, we, we never had a technology plan, but we decided we want to have one now for updating our computers. We realize everyone's complaining about the computers, they're always too, too old. Let's get that on a schedule. Let's figure that out. That would be a goal. So it could be all sorts of things. Um, and then evaluation criteria for the projects and evaluating the plan itself. If you fill in all these parts on this and then hand that in to me, you will have all of the required elements. Now, depending on what you wrote, I may need you to expand some of them or fix some things, but we get to that when we do our back and forth as I'm evaluating both your plan and your accreditation application form. But once you have that, you have your community's response plan. Ta-da! <laughs> All right. Does anybody have any questions about this plan? Um, type into your question section anything I didn't cover, anything you're confused about, um, anything you want to know more about. Mm. All right. Uh, the plan can. I think from what I hear from many libraries is the most intimidating part of the accreditation process, I think, because it is this big document that you do have to write. Uh, I recommend taking it in parts, you know, break it up into small pieces, do it a little bit at a time, uh, start as early as possible. You don't have, do not have to wait for that July 1st date to work on your plan. July 1st is just when I, um, the application, online application form goes live and I officially invite anyone to re-credit or re-credit for the first time. You can be working on this plan anytime. I've had libraries do one of these a year before they knew they were due for re-accreditation or two years before, whenever they happen to be, you know, their old one's expiring or they decided now's the time to do it because we have a, a slower year or whatever, and that's perfectly fine. But as long as your plan covers the year that you're applying for accreditation, it is perfectly fine to have it run any year as possible. But take it in bits and pieces. Use these examples as format, as a, as a template. Absolutely and not a problem to do that. Just make sure that you do like, here's Ponca's. It doesn't even have a cover page or a uh, table of contents. It just jumps right into it. <laughs> and um, that is per oh, as, to, as a temp, temp uh, uh, Table of contents on the second page. I was wrong. I lied. <laughs> so um, use these as templates. It's okay to use the older ones, even though they might have that SWOT analysis. Just remember, you do not have to do a SWOT. You can do the more general um, taking stock of your library that I've changed it to. Um, but you will see these will mention SWOT a lot. SWOT a lot. All right. So that is your community's response plan. Uh, and that is the, the last part that is required for being accredited. You need to do your survey, meet your requirements, submit your application, and get that plan to me. And then we will work on, as I said, we work um, together back and forth from whenever you submit it to me to whenever I um, uh, determine your accreditation. Uh, you, July 1st, things go live. Uh, you could submit your application form that day, send me your <laughs> Uh, community's response plan that day, July 1st, and I do have to, you know, spend some time looking at it. Possibly within a week, you'll know that you're accredited for the next year, starting in 2025. You could know that in July, um, but you have until October or even later if I give, give extensions. Um, as late as December 31st, I may be getting back to you on if you're um, accredited, uh, re-accredited or accredited. But that is everything that we needed to cover today about uh, public library accreditation, communities response planning, certification, everything. So what questions do you still have? 
what questions do you have? Uh, please type into the question section. Let me know if there is anything that I missed, anything you were wondering about that I did not cover, um, if anything specific to your library. Uh, let me know and I will I can answer your questions. We still have about 10 minutes of our official three hours available here, so I can answer any questions you have right now. So please go ahead and type um, in the question section or the chat. Nothing? All right. Uh, that's okay. If you can't think of anything right now, that's understandable. This is a lot of information, I know. Um, but hopefully it was helpful to you. Um, if you are due for accreditation this year, look for my email on Monday, July 1st. I will be sending that out um, that morning, inviting you to apply for reaccreditation. If you're not accredited, but you've done your public library survey, I'll be sending you an invite email saying, hey, you've done the survey. We are inviting you to apply for uh, to become accredited. And if you're in a future year, which I know some of you are, uh, start looking at that plan, looking at your current one, see if you want to get that updated. Like I said, you do not have to wait till your accreditation year to do that. You can do that at any time, as long as it covers the year when you do are due for your reaccreditation. All right, you're welcome, Gail. I see some thanks coming through. You're welcome. So I hope this is helpful. Uh, Good luck on um, your accreditation. Hopefully, we will have many of you renewing and maybe some new libraries. I'm always happy to have new libraries become accredited here. All right, you're welcome. You're welcome. So, do let me know if you have any questions, issues as you're going through your accreditation process. We will get you all through this. All right, thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>